jokes. Get back to bed. You'll catch your death. It's cold running around in your bare feet. My feet ain't cold, Daddy. I want to ask you something. Well, what is it? When is Easter? Sunday. It's a little earlier than usual this year. Why? I don't know. It just happens to fall on the 24th. Why? Because Easter Sunday is governed by the date of the Paschal full moon. If the Paschal full moon falls on a Sunday, then Easter day is the next Sunday. If the moon falls? Yes. The Paschal full moon is the 14th day of a lunar month, but reckoned according to an ancient ecclesiastical computation, not the real or astronomical full moon. You know everything, don't you, Dad? Just about. Any more questions? Uh-huh. Why does Easter fall on Sunday? Because it does. This year it was pushed ahead. Who pushed it? Nobody pushed it. Well, how did it fall? I don't know. Good night. Good night. Daddy! Well? Who tells the bunnies when it's Easter? Nobody. Well, how did they know when the lady ate? Bunnies don't lay eggs. Why? How do I know? Chickens lay eggs. I can't help it. Why? Uh, Snooks, it's way past your bedtime. And I don't propose to sit here and discuss biology with you. Go to bed. Tell me how the bunnies lay the colour these days. They don't. It's just an old tradition, that's all. The rabbit is somehow associated with Easter and coloured eggs and that sort of stuff. And I don't know, only chickens lay eggs. Rabbit eggs? No chicken eggs. Do the rabbits lay chicken eggs? No. The chicken lays rabbit eggs. Uh, the, the chicken doesn't lay eggs at all. I mean the rabbit. Holy oh, Phil alone. Well, who lays the Easter eggs? I just told you. No, you didn't. All right. You want the rabbit to lay the Easter eggs? No. You want the chicken to lay them? No. Well, who do you want to lay the eggs? You. All right, I'll lay the Easter eggs. Good night. Good night, lay one now. Oh, I will not. And if you don't go right to bed, there won't be any eggs or bunnies or anything. Will there be any Easter? Come on, young lady. I can see I'll have to tuck you in myself. <laughs> I like that. All right, get under these covers. All right. Daddy. Yes? When you buy me a bunny for Easter? I'll think about it. When? Tonight. In the meantime, just say your prayers and ask the angels to make you a good girl so you can get a rabbit. All right. Dear angels, please make my daddy a good boy so he can buy me a rabbit for Easter. Oh, that's no way to talk to the angels. They like it. Now, how do you know? I'll show you. You like it, don't you, angels? That's okay with us, Nooks. You'll get your rabbit, kid. <laughs> oh, what keepers. Good night. Good night, Daddy. <laughs> Daddy, played by Hanley Stafford, tried for hours to talk Snooks out of getting an Easter bunny. But it was no use. The more he hollered, the more she cried. So we find them now walking to the pet shop where Benny Rubin, our man with a thousand voices, is proprietor. And Daddy trying some last-minute persuading. Listen. Oh, Snooks, are you sure you want a real live rabbit? I'm sure, Daddy. You don't want a big chocolate one that you can eat? No, I'll eat the live one. You little cannibal. I hate to give in to you. Why? Because I don't like to pamper your whim. You did it last night and it still hurts. That's not what I mean at all. Well, for the last time, have you got your mind set on the rabbit or would you like something else? Something else. Oh, really? What do you want? I want some candy. Instead of the rabbit? No, with the rabbit. Then you can't have any candy. Why? Because you can only have one or the other. Then I want a real live rabbit. Okay. That's what candy. <laughs> That's all you think about. Candy, candy, candy. Candy, candy, candy. Oh, stop it. <laughs> what did you do with that candy cat I gave you yesterday? You said you'd save it. I did save it, Daddy. I stroked it and stroked it the whole day. Well, where is it now? It got so dirty I had to eat it. <laughs> That's fine. Well, you can't have any more candy. Settled? Settled. Here's the rabbit shop, Daddy. I see it. And you still want that broken-down rabbit? Uh-huh. All right. 
Now, before we go into this place, I want you to understand that if I buy you a rabbit, you'll be completely responsible for his care and feeding. Follow? Follow. And no rough handling. You're to handle your rabbit exactly the way Mother handles little Robespierre. Well, I have to change his... You'll have to change his water every day. That ain't what Never I... Never mind that. <laughs> and you'll also make sure that his hutch is kept spotless. Right. You will if you want a rabbit. I want him, Daddy. Very well. Heaven knows I've done all I could to talk you out of it. I guess it takes a smarter man than me. You're dumb, ain't you, Daddy? <laughs> I certainly must be. And you're the most obstinate child I ever saw. I can't imagine where you got that stubbornness. I got it from Mummy. Oh, no. She's still got hers. <laughs> well, come on, let's get that rabbit. <laughs> Look at Daddy. What is it? Look who's in that cave. That's a blue-nosed baboon. And don't tell me you thought it was Uncle Louie. <laughs> Uncle Louie. That's fine. I thought it was Aunt Selfie. <laughs> oh, come away. Snooks, get your hand out of that glass case. <laughs> Here's a play of whistling without any door. Let it go. That's a snake. I want it, Daddy. Let me see your hand. Did he bite you? No, he just rattled his head. Oh. <laughs> you don't know how close you came to getting bitten. That's a rattlesnake. One of the most venomous reptiles in the world. I think he's pretty, Daddy. Hey, you would. Yeah. Oh, come on, let's buy the rabbit. Here's the man. Uh, good evening, sir. Good evening. Oh, uh, Snooks, tell the gentleman what you want. I want a rattlesnake. She does not. <laughs> she wants a rabbit. Oh, of course. A little bunny for a sweet little girl. Isn't that right, Angel? Who <laughs> oh, he's talking to, Daddy? <laughs> you got me. Just give her a rabbit and let's get out of here. Certainly. Step this way, please. Can I have one of those puppies, Daddy? No. Only a rabbit. How oh, are puppy toys? Those puppies are only for display. They're not for sale. Oh, yes, they are. Who asked you? <laughs> I beg your pardon. How did the puppies get so white? Oh, that's their natural color. Would you like to stroke one? Uh-huh. Here we are. <laughs> Cute, isn't he? He's a spit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> huh? He's a spitz. Hurry up and stroke him. I wanna. Well, why not? I'm afraid he'll spit on me. <laughs> very amusing. Yeah, very. Where's the rabbit? Uh, right back here. I have some very beautiful birds, too. Would you care to see them? No, let's get to the rabbit. I want to see a bird, Daddy. Uh, just let me take the cover off this cage. I'll show you a gorgeous bird. There. Did you ever see such superb plumage? Say, that's really pretty. Look at it, Snooks. What is it? Why, it's a purple finch. I can tell that at a glance. I'm sorry, it's not a purple finch at all. No? Huh? <laughs> it's called Sternella neglecta, more commonly known as the laughing jay. The laughing jay? Yes, this bird has no nest, is hunted constantly by hawks, and rarely finds enough food to keep him alive. Well, what you got to laugh about? If it's not asking too much, mister, I'd love to buy a rabbit and get out of here. <laughs> I don't want no rabbit. Well, what do you want? I want a rattlesnake. I told you you can't have any rattlesnakes. Then I want that funny-looking thing with the long hair there. Where? Sitting there on that bench. Uh, that's my wife. <laughs> Gruesome, isn't she? Yeah. Well, what kind of a place is this? Come on, Snooks, we're going home. Why? Because you promised you'd just get a rabbit and leave. Come buy me a rabbit, Dad. All right, but no nonsense. Bring a rabbit, quick. Yeah. And Snooks, don't fool around with those bird cages. I'm doing nothing, Dad. Kids enough to drive anybody crazy. Hurry up, will you, mister? I'm, I'm coming. Here's a lovely little chap. Do you like him? Fine. Give us some rabbit food, too. Yes, sir. Oh, Snooks! Snooks, what are you doing for that parrot? I, I, I want to make an Indian hat. Oh, heavens! You've ruined my African cockatoo. I want to pull this feathers out. Well, that's the most valuable bird I have in the place. Snooks, what's the matter with you? Are you insane? <laughs> that one looks funny all naked. Oh, the poor bird is ruined. He's ruined. Well, don't 
don't get so hysterical. Yeah, don't get so hysterical. You keep quiet. Uh, well, you don't understand. That African cockatoo was the smartest bird in the world. He was? He could speak seven languages. Well, why did he say something when I started to pull his feathers out? That's enough out of you. Done. All right, mister, I'll pay you for the bird. Here's my card. Now, send me the bill. Oh, thank you, sir. You understand. Yes, I... I understand. Come with me, Snooks. Uh, aren't you taking the rabbit? No, forget the rabbit. Wait, Daddy. Am I going to get something? Oh, yes, dear. You're going to get something. <laughs> Can I get it now? Why, certainly. <laughs> what is it? Just this. <laughs> Presenting the transcription feature, Superman. Up in the sky, look, it's a bird, it's a plane, it's Superman. And now, Superman. When we last saw him, Clark Kent was traveling toward the mountain city of Dyerville with Lois Lane to investigate a curious chain of disasters and accidents that had held the city in a grip of fear for the past eight days. But as they reached the toll bridge over the Jefferson River, leading into Dyerville, the bridge suddenly trembled and swayed. Lois screamed as their automobile slid toward the guardrail, and Kent leaped away in the darkness. As our story continues, he has become Superman. Red cloak streaming in the wind, he plummets down through the night in a desperate effort to save the bridge and prevent the car from plunging into the river below. Listen. That bridge is shaking like a tree in a high wind. If I can get down under it and hold it, find out what's wrong. Here we are. Why, the foundation's half gone. Blown apart as if it had been hit by a shell or a torpedo. Those girders are just hanging loose. If I can only put them back where they belong. I don't know. It's pretty far gone, but maybe I can make it. If I don't, the whole thing will fall off. Crash in the river. Blow us along with it. Now then, one more pull. <sighs> Made it. Twisted that steel work back into place. Now to return to Lois on the bridge as Clark Kent. Up! Up! What's happened? Where are the lights? So dark. Kent! Kent! Lois! I mean, Miss Lane, uh, are you all right? The bridge. What about the bridge? Oh, don't worry about the bridge. But what was it? What happened? Oh, I don't know. Maybe the foundation gave way in the flood. We'll be all right if we keep going. Come on, get back in the car. Uh, lucky it didn't roll off the bridge and smash up. Kent, we can't cross now. Oh, yes, we can. I, I've paid the toll. Clark, Kent, you fool, I'm not thinking about the toll. The bridge will go down with no, us. No, it won't, Lois. It's safe now, I'm sure. Come on, get in. Here we go. Now, if you're the least bit afraid, just shut your eyes. Clark Kent and Lois Lane cross the damaged bridge safely and arrive in Dyerville. Next morning, in the office of the city commissioner, they wait for an interview. Oh, here he is now. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning. Here, this is Miss Lane, I take it, and Mr. Clark Kent, both of the Daily Planet. Sorry to bother you, Commissioner, but we're after a story about what's been going on in Dyerville. Yes, come into my office and close the door. All right. Uh, sit down, Miss Lane, Mr. Kent. Thanks, Commissioner. We won't take up too much of your time. Yeah, don't worry. If you were ordinary reporters, you wouldn't take up any of it. I'd see to that. But I've had a call from your editor. Oh, you have? From Mr. White? Yes, Perry White of the Daily Planet. It's about you, Kent. Me? Yes, Mr. White tells me that you're not only a good reporter, but that you seem to have a knack of digging out what's back of things. Well, uh, I'm sure I don't know. It's I... a knack or just dumb luck. Well, either one will do me. Because if I don't get to the bottom of this business, and soon... Uh, Just what's happening, Commissioner? Well, have you heard about the Jefferson Bridge last night? What? The South Pier was carried away as if a giant monster had bitten a chunk out of it. Good heavens, and we were on it. Yes, but that's not all. Whatever it was, some human agency or mysterious force not only almost took the bridge away, but put it back. What? That's what I say. Most of the steel girders were torn loose from their rivets, but someone replaced them, twisted them together so they'd hold. Why, only a Superman could have done it. Superman? Uh, Just imagine that. Well, forget about the bridge. It's the least of what's happened. There was the matter of the electric power. Three days ago, it went completely out for no explainable reason. And what about that flood, Commissioner? Yes, yes, the flood. And the earthquakes or explosions or whatever they were. I tell you, I can't stand much more of this. 
None of us can. Why, we never know from one moment to another what's going to happen next. Huh. And there's uh, no explanation? No clue of any kind? Kent, not a one. What if they're not accidents? What if there's some human fiend behind all this? What's he trying to do? What does he want? Does he intend wiping the city off the map? Oh, no, no, no. Take it easy, Commissioner. There's probably some very simple explanation. Well, all right. All right. Probably there is. But you find it, Kent. Go out and dig it up. Say, I've had the best men I know on it so far, and they haven't found a thing. I tell you, I'm at the end of my rope. Well, Miss Lane and I may be able to help, Commissioner. And I hope so, Kent. I hope so. Because if this madness doesn't stop soon, I think we'll all go out of our minds. If there's just one more catastrophe, one more unexplained accident... Hmm. Hello? Yes, yes, this is the Commissioner. What? Bart? When did it happen? Mr. Kent, what is it? Quiet, I want to hear. What? Yes? Well, get every boat in the river, you understand? Every boat. Yes, call tugs and police launches. But land that barge. Get it out of trouble. Listen, something's gone wrong on the river. Yes, yes, call me back. I'll be right here by the phone. Commissioner, what is it? What's happened? There's a railroad barge with 15 tank cars on it loaded with gasoline. It broke loose from its tug. What? It's drifting downstream toward the falls. Toward the falls? Yes, and they can't stop it. They can't stop it. The tide's too strong. They can't do a thing. Kent, where are you going? Where do you think? Out to find that barge. I'll see you later, Commissioner. Uh, you wait here, Miss Lane. Some story in that. I'll be back as soon as I can. Wait. Wait, I'll come too. Wait. Sorry, Lois. Can't stop now. If there's an emergency like that, it's time Clark Kent gave way to Superman. Ah, here's a window. No one in sight. Good. We're up. Up and away! Off like a streak of light, Superman leaps into the air, heads for the river, and disappears in a bank of mist. Meanwhile, the Jefferson River is a scene of terror and confusion. Whistles scream, but nothing can stop the swift course of the helpless railroad barge. Caught in the rapid current and moving ever faster toward the falls, the two men on the barge are frantic with fear. They can't get us. We're going faster and faster. Look, dead ahead. Ain't that the falls? No, we're going over. We're going over, sure. We gotta jump. Jump and swim for it. No, no, don't jump. Stay with the barge. It's our only chance. I tell you, we'll be killed, drowned, smashed to pieces. Jump. Jump, I tell you. Oh. Jump. Ah, there's the barge. And there are the falls, too. Not much time. Got to dive down there, grab that barge load of railroad cars, and tow them back where they came from. I must be careful. One spark might set that gasoline off. Down into the water. Down. Down. Now then, three good strokes and I'm there. One, two, three. Ah, got them. I've caught the barge. Now all I have to do is tow it back up the river. And without being seen, here we go. Superman, exerting his terrific strength, brings the heavily loaded barge around in the river, forces it upstream, eases it safely into a dock and disappears again in the murky water of the Jefferson River. And presently, back in the office of the city commissioner, where Lois still waits. There it is. There it is. That barge. It's gone over the falls. I hardly dare answer the phone. Shall I take it, commissioner? No, no. Hello? Yes? What? You... You say it's safe? It... It slid back upstream? Floated into a dock? And it didn't go over the falls? Say, wait a minute. You, you're sure? What? Well, I, I don't care how it happened. All I need to know is they're safe. Oh, Miss Lane, Miss Lane, that barge is all right. Well, Commissioner, what's happened? Well, I don't know. Some crazy, impossible story, but who cares about that? Yes, come in, come in. Hello, Commissioner. Oh. Hi, Miss Lane. Well, hello there, Kent. I guess you've heard the news, too, huh? About the barge? <laughs> yes, and I decided I might as well come back. <laughs> you didn't get your big story after all, did you, Mr. Kent? Oh, there's still a story, Miss Lane. Uh, what do you mean? What do you mean? That affair of the railroad barge breaking away from its tug was no accident, sir. What? Mr. Kent knows all the answers, Commissioner. Those cars and that gasoline were meant to go over the Jefferson River Falls. Oh, I can't. You're joking. No, no. No, I'm not joking. Mr. Kent, how do you know all this? Very simple, Miss Lane. 
The steel cable joining the barge and the tug didn't break. It was cut. Commissioner. Yes, yes. Commissioner, have you heard? Did you get it? Get what? What are you talking about? Quick, turn on your radio. Radio? Radio? What are you talking about? Come on, it's on, Commissioner. Yes, yes. Kyaville. What? Calling the city of Kyaville. What's that? Listen, What's that? listen. Calling the city of Kyaville. The secret empire demands the sum of one million dollars. One million dollars is the price of Kyaville. To be paid by midnight tomorrow. If it is not paid, Tyreville will cease to exist. This is the yellow mask. Tyreville, calling the Shut city of that Tyreville. thing off. What does it mean? Ken. What does it mean? Ken, did you hear? The yellow mask. We thought he was dead. Killed when that plane crashed. What's she talking about? Kent, what is it? Commissioner, it means just this. Miss Lane and I have met the yellow mask before. It means that unless you raise one million dollars by midnight tomorrow... Dyerville will be wiped off the face of the earth. Suddenly, like the shadow of a dreadful nightmare, the hand of the yellow mask hangs darkly over Dyerville. Now the reason is clear for the long chain of accidents that plagued the city. The yellow mask has been placing the people of the town in the grip of a deadly terror. What will happen next? What can Superman do in the few short hours that remain? Tune in next time and follow the story. Be sure to tune in the next thrilling installment of the amazing transcription feature, Superman. Up in the sky, look, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. <laughs> Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Action Comics magazine. Radio's own show, Behind the Mic. <laughs> Radio, with the switch of a dial, radio brings you tragedy, comedy, entertainment, information, education, a whole world at your command. But there are stories behind radio, stories behind your favorite program and favorite personalities and radio people you never hear of. Stories as amusing, dramatic, and as interesting as any make-believe stories you hear on the air. And that's what we give you, the human interest, the glamour, the tragedy, the comedy, and information that are behind the mic. And now, presenting a man whose name, since the beginning of broadcasting, has been a byword in radio, Graham McNamee. Thank you, Gil Martin, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen of the radio audience. This afternoon, Behind the Mic presents the story of how a radio character actor does his stuff, how sound effects are made, and the odd story behind the time an announcer was supposed to broadcast from the famous Coconut Grove in Hollywood. We bring you back a few moments of the old Atwater Kent program. And finally, there will be a dramatization of a remarkable story told by Jimmy Wallington. You wouldn't be a radio listener if you didn't wonder every once in a while how those sound effects you hear on programs are made. The sound of a taxi, a shotgun, a train wreck, and all the rest of the noises that are necessary to a script. We have two of the best sound effects men in the business here tonight, and they will demonstrate various sound effects and tell you how they're made. Ted Slade will do the actual effects, and Ray Kelly, head of the NBC sound effects department, will explain how each effect is done. <laughs> now, Ted, our sound man, has his equipment set up next to a microphone. And I'm going to tell a rather crazy story, which will use many sound effects, and Ray Kelly will explain how each effect was made. Our story begins with our hero's train pulling into the railroad station. Ladies and gentlemen, that sound was created by using four records, each on a different turntable and all operated by Ted Slade. Our hero goes to his home and walks up the snow-covered path. That sound is produced by taking a box of cornstarch and squeezing it in the same rhythm in which a person would walk. Our hero opens his door. 
And that, believe it or not, is a door. <laughs> <laughs> he discovers a burglar, and they have a terrific fight. And that was accomplished by Ted Slade, the sound man, engaging in a civil war. He punched the open palm of his hand with his fist, he hit himself on the chest, threw several chairs around, broke some fruit baskets, and finally smashed some glass in front of the microphone. You should have seen that boy beat himself up. <laughs> well, our hero now tries to phone the police, but his telephone wires have been cut, so he ties up the burglar and takes him to the police station in his old horse and wagon. That wagon is a box mounted on casters which the sound effects man wiggles with his foot. Ted impersonated the horse by taking two rubber plungers and hitting them on his chest. Both the caster box and the plungers are worked simultaneously. Our hero takes the burglar to jail where he is safely locked up. <laughs> and that sound was done by closing a specially built door constructed exactly like a cell door. How do you know? You don't get me on that one. I saw the specification. <laughs> And then, to give the scene a punch ending, and still another sound effect, our hero, wearily enough, feeling pleased with himself, decides to go for a row on the lake. The lap of the water is created by using a splash box. This is a tank of water with a paddle in it, which is turned slowly to produce the sound of rowing. The squeak of the oar lock was made by using a squeak box. A little gadget that's too complicated to explain here. And as the moon rises, we leave our hero rowing to his heart's content. <laughs> Equally pleased that he has captured the burglar and that he has made his first and last appearance on a radio program. Those of you who listen to our program regularly will remember that we have had as guests on Behind the Mic two of the best comedy character actors in radio. Tonight, we have as a guest a different type of actor, a legitimate character actor, a man who plays a large number of different roles, mostly on dramatic shows. He has appeared in Arch Obler's plays, on the Kate Smith Show, and in a great many daytime serials. Tonight, we'd like you to meet him in person. Introducing character actor Gilbert Mack. Gil, what background have you got for character acting? Well, Graham, I played in stock and I sang in vaudeville and I was even a hillbilly yodeler. As a matter of fact, I broke into radio as a yodeler. Don't tell me that being a mountain William helped you to become a radio actor. Well, as a matter of fact, Graham, I think it did. I'm sure that the flexibility of my voice was helped by my yodeling. I believe that one of the reasons I can play so many characters is because my vocal cords are so elastic. Oh, so your vocal cords are elastic. <laughs> you must come around and snap them for us sometime. <laughs> well, now that we've got your background stuff, how about showing us some of the characters you actually portray on the air? All right, Graham. I'll do that in a little sketch in which I'm going to play all the parts. The scene is the home of the rich Mr. Brownlee. In the spacious living room, a group of people are gathered listening to Mr. Brownlee. So if you will tell me exactly what you heard and saw last night, we may be able to find some trace of that missing necklace. Gee, Dad, I was in my room all night. We're sure of that, Tommy. But uh, did you hear any strange noise? Well, Grandpa, I got so interested in my ghost story magazine. Uh-huh. Ghost stories. That ain't for me. I just... Quiet, Sam. We'll get nowhere unless we stick to facts. Mr. Brownlee's right, Sam. Uh, suppose we hear from uh, our houseboy, Sato. Oh, thank you, sir. Uh, last night, about three o'clock, I are suddenly aware of presence of strange gentlemen in bedchamber. Then saw a gentleman are putting Sito back to sleep with well-priest tap on head. And when you awoke this morning, the necklace was gone from the wall safe. Gee, Dad, this looks like a case for the G-men. Say, look at that car pulling up outside. Oh. <laughs> Say, I wonder who that man coming in there, huh? Yes, and who's that little fella he's dragging along there with him? Well, I'm Detective Mannigan from headquarters, and they brought along a suspect. They found him snooping around outside the house. Well, I know that man. He's Tony, our vegetable dealer. That's right. 
I'm a just a poor man. I'm a selling fruits and vegetables. I'm a do nothing. And this is said to me, I'm a crook. Doing nothing, is it? Well, then, how come this pearl necklace I found in your pocket? Yes, sir, that's the jewelry. Hey, please, Mr. Cop. I'm going to tell you just what happened. When I come here before, I ring the bell. Sato, he's opening up the door and pushing his junk in my hand. What am I going to do, eh? So I'm going to hang around and wait when you come along and pull me inside. That's all. So, Sato gave you that necklace, eh? Oh, please, sir. Is this a serious mistake? Never mind the alibis. Come clean or I'll take you down to the station house for questioning. Oh, please, sir. I are willing to tell the truth if you'll promise not to give me no third-degree copper. Gee, Dad, Sato lost his accent. That's right. Sato isn't quite what we thought he was. Well, I thought I could get away with this disguise till I pulled this job off, but I guess it didn't work out. But Sato, or uh, whatever your real name is, where did you learn such a neat trick? That was a cinch. After all, I did a ten-year stretch up in a big house, and I was a star performer every year on the annual show. And it looks like you're going back for return engagement. Folks, Gilbert Mack not only played every character, but he also made the sound effects of the scream of the automobile brakes. With my own elastic vocal cord. And you sure did snap them that time. Thank you, Gilbert Mack. Thank you. Oddities in Radio. Presenting odd little true behind-the-mic stories that help make radio sometimes amusing, sometimes exasperating, but always interesting to the people in it. This week's oddity. One of NBC's prominent young announcers is Don Cordray, who appeared on this program a few weeks ago in an interview. Don has an unusual story of, uh, shall I say, uh, an amusing experience which we thought merited his reappearance. Don, suppose you tell us your story. All right, Graham. Graham. This is going to take us back a few years, but I was an announcer at KFI in Los Angeles. At the time, my burning ambition was to broadcast from the Coconut Grove, where Gus Arnheim was playing at that time. Why was that such an ambition? Well, Graham, it may sound silly, but because the Coconut Grove meant getting a chance to meet those movie stars and be seen by them. For a whole year, I ate out my heart and soul just to do one broadcast on a Saturday night for a full hour from Coconut Grove. Well, on a Friday, the chief announcer, Tom Hanlon, called me into his office and said that Freeman Lang, the regular announcer of the Coconut Grove, was ill. I was to fill in for him on that Saturday. Well, Graham, believe it or not, I was so excited at the thought of doing that broadcast, I went out and hired a full dress suit for 12 and a half bucks. The next night, I was at Coconut Grove, but mind you, plenty early. I saw the engineer as I entered the Grove, and he called me when he saw me come in and said, Hey, Don, what you doing here so early? Well, I don't know, Paul, just sort of looking around. Boy, this is some place, isn't it? Yeah. Well, Don, as long as you aren't doing anything, I wonder if you'd help me out. See that microphone tied up against the wall? Mm Mm-hmm. Well, it's hanging from the ceiling, and I'm going to untie it so that it'll swing over the center of the stage. Will you catch it for me? Oh, sure thing. I'll be careful when it swings over. It's heavy. (laughs) Okay. Here she goes. Hey, Don! Who's that? Why, Charlie, what are you... Hey, look out! It's going to hit you! Oh! There, stand back up. Come on, give him some air. Step aside, will you? (laughs) Doctor, he's got to do a broadcast tonight. Broadcast? Not this boy. When that mic hit his head, it knocked him out for the evening. And I was knocked out, Graham. They called for another announcer. I think it was Ken Carpenter. I never got a chance to broadcast from Coconut Grove. (laughs) You poor guy. Socked on the coconut by the coconut. Behind the mic salutes a program you loved. We in radio believe that radio has a tradition of which it can well be proud. A tradition of good programs that linger fondly in our memory. And so each week, we bring you a star or a part of a program you used to hear. A program you loved. This afternoon, Behind the Mic salutes the old Atwater Kent Hour, which with its national auditions was designed to select the best non-professional singers in the country each year. We recreate part of the Atwater Kent auditions of December 11th, 1927, with the actual winner of the first national competition, the delightful concert soprano, Agnes Davis. The Atwater Kent Hour. (laughs) 
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the radio audience. Tonight, Atwater Kent presents the finals of what is probably the most important musical competition ever attempted in the United States. Every singer in the United States under 25 years of age has had an opportunity to be heard. By the process of elimination in local auditions, the contestants have been reduced to five young women and five young men who have qualified for the national finals. They will sing tonight in the final competition. The Atwater Kent Foundation will award the young woman and young man winning first place $5,000 cash, a gold decoration, and two years of musical tuition. The winners of this contest will be selected by a jury of nine eminent musical authorities. Each singer will be announced by name. The first singer is Miss Mary Sims, who will sing the Caranome. <laughs> Miss Marie Bronazic of Chicago, who will sing A Forza Lui from Traviata. <laughs> Our next contestant, Benjamin P. DeLoach, Jr., will sing Drink to Me Only with Thine Eyes. As the last of the ten contestants, Miss Agnes Davis of Denver will sing Pace Pace Mio Dio by Verdi. <laughs> Hey! 
Ladies and gentlemen, the contest which means so much to young singers who traveled so far to take part in the finals of the nationwide search for America's finest and most promising young artists sponsored by the Atwater Kent Foundation is ended. The judge's decision will be announced within the next hour, we hope, by the station through which you are listening. This is Graham McNamee saying good evening for the Atwater Kent Hour. An hour later, when the judges had made their decision, I was happy to announce over the air that Miss Agnes Davis had been adjudged the winner of the first prize for young women singers, $5,000, a two-year musical scholarship, and a gold medal. Today, Miss Davis, who has appeared as soloist with the leading symphony orchestras throughout the United States, is rated as one of the best concert artists in the country. And as an old friend, Agnes, let me add that after Pache Pache, we need no further proof. from listeners. Each week we invite the listeners of Behind the Mic to write us questions about radio and the three or four we consider to be of most general interest we have answered on the air by the radio editor of some outstanding newspaper or magazine. Tonight's questions will be answered by C.J. Ingram, radio editor of the Jersey City Journal and for 10 years conductor of his own program, Stardust. <laughs> Miss Thelma Reed of Boston, Massachusetts writes in to say, I am a constant listener to Bob Burns' program. I read somewhere that Bob Burns was an expert rifle shot. Is this true, or is it just publicity? Well, for Miss Reed's information, Bob Burns is really a, a crack shot. As a matter of fact, he was rifle champion of the AEF and got a gold medal signifying his championship, a medal which was pinned on him by General Pershing himself. Miss Rose Farrell of Mount Pleasant, Pennsylvania, writes in to ask, since radio is now celebrating its 20th year of broadcasting, can you tell me what was the very first broadcast and what were the call letters of the station that gave the program? Well, we find there are two schools of thought as to which was the first station to broadcast a regularly scheduled program. The majority of persons in radio seem to think that KDKA in Pittsburgh was the first station to broadcast, and its program was the Harding Cox Election Returns, broadcast November the 2nd, 1920. However, there are some who claim that station WWJ of Detroit broadcast the first regularly scheduled program on August 21st, 1920, when it broadcast the returns of the state primaries. 
Miss Marjorie Miller of Birmingham, Alabama, right? I am a frequent listener to the broadcast from the Metropolitan Opera. Can you tell me when was the first broadcast from the Metropolitan Opera House? In answer to Miss Miller's question, the first broadcast from the Metropolitan was on January 13th, 1910, when an experimental station operated by the DeForest Radiophone broadcast the voice of the great Enrico Caruso and Emmy Destin from backstage. The broadcast was picked up at sea by the steamship Avon. Miss Martha Burnett of New York City asked this question. Can you tell me what was the first program ever to appear on a network? The first program ever to appear on a network was that given by the Sweethearts of the Air, Peter DeRose and May Singy Breen, on a network consisting of WRC Washington and WEAF New York City, and the broadcast originated in Washington. Thank you, C.J. Ingram, for answering those questions for us. Thanks a lot. A week or so ago, I was having lunch with a man whose voice must have been heard by every radio listener in the last 10 years. He's been an important cog in many big programs, and right now he's the announcer on the new Fred Allen Show. Yes, of course, I mean Jimmy Wallington. Jimmy told me a behind-the-mic story I thought was so good and so unusual that I invited him to come here this afternoon to tell you about it. And here he is to do that very thing. But first, I want to welcome him back to the East, Jimmy Wallington. <laughs> Hello, Jimmy. How are you? Fine, thank you, Graham. And believe me, it's good to be back with you and my other good friends in New York City. The story starts back in the early 1920s. The scene was the Mojave Desert, way out west in California. An auto was speeding along the dusty highway, and there was a good reason for it to speed, too. In the back seat were a husband and his wife. The wife, in agony, had suddenly been stricken with an attack of acute appendicitis. Their friend, the driver, was getting every last ounce of speed he could from the car in an effort to reach a doctor in the town of Mojave as quickly as possible, when suddenly... What's the matter? I don't know. Must be something wrong with the engine. I'll take a look at it. How are you, dear? It's pretty bad. Well, don't worry. We'll get you to a doctor just as soon as we possibly can. Oh, this is awful. We're out of oil and one of the bearings is shot. Well, can you fix it? I'm not here. I'd have to hail a car, explain the situation, and ask them to take her to a doctor. They can't refuse. Oh, oh here's one now. Hey! Hey, stop! 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 I'll try the next one. This is terrible. Darling, if there was something I could do. Here comes another one. Hey, stop! 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 We've had an accident! Oh, why don't they stop? I don't know. Maybe they're afraid we're going to hold them up or something. I think there was a holdup along here not long ago. But we've got to get her to a doctor. Hasn't been a car along here for half an hour. Oh, here's one. This one's got to stop. Stop! Hey, hey, stop! Stop! What's the matter? This lady is sick. We've got to get her to the doctor at Mojave as fast as we can. We'll be glad to take him, won't we, Dad? Why, well, sure thing, son. Come on, get in back, folks, and I'll have you there in a jiffy. <laughs> The scene now changes to an Atwater Kent program in 1928. Although you did the actual program announcing Graham, as you know, I also worked on that program. On one Atwater Kent program each year, as you've shown tonight, ten candidates for musical scholarships and large cash prizes would compete and some of the foremost people in the musical world would act as judges to select the winner. And also, as you know, the judges did not see the contestants while they were singing, so they could judge them by the voice alone. Contestants and judges met after the first, for the first time after the program when a little party would be held in an adjoining studio. And after this particular program, the evening's winner approached one of the judges who had awarded him the first prize of $5,000. Oh, pardon me, sir. But uh, may I speak to you a moment? Why, certainly. I want to congratulate you, young man. You did splendidly. Oh, well, thank you, sir. But um, I want to ask you something. Do you remember a long time ago 
when you were driving a lady to the doctor and your car broke down in the Mojave Desert, a man came along with his son and they took you to the doctor in their car? Well, yes, I remember that vividly. Do you mean... Yes, sir. I was the boy. Why, of course, now I remember. The father's name was Novus, and you're Donald Novus, his son. This is remarkable. Yes, sir. But even more remarkable to me is that tonight, for the first time, I should find out that the man we helped was the great Lawrence Tibbet. <laughs> Thank you for bringing us a very great story, Jimmy Wallington. Thanks a lot. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions about the inside of radio that you wish answered on the air, write a letter to us. Address it to Graham McNamee, Behind the Mic, National Broadcasting Company, New York City. As many questions as possible will be answered by mail, and those we feel to be of most general interest will be answered on this program. Be sure to listen in next week when we will bring you one of the funniest, most fantastic Behind the Mic stories you ever heard. A story behind Dave Ellman's Hobby Lobby program, as told by Dave Ellman himself. We will also bring you the story of a man who makes a living dying on the radio, and more of the human interest, the glamour, the comedy, and the drama that are found behind the mic. Behind the Mic is written by Mort Lewis, original music composed and conducted by Ernie Watson. This is the National Broadcasting Company. The Pepsodent Show, starring Bob Hope and his guest, Humphrey Bogart. Here we are at noon, folks. Time for Moon and Spoon, folks. And the laugh with all the staff and our Bob Hope. Thank you. How do you do, ladies and gentlemen? This is Bob June Bride's Hope, telling you girls that even if you don't get flowers from your feller, if you use Pepsodent, you'll always have white lilies under your smeller. <laughs> Well, yes, sir, here we are back in Hollywood. Last week, we did our show from Camp San Luis Obispo for the 40th Division, and what a time we had. And from the way those soldiers greeted me, believe me, folks, America's ready. <laughs> they gave me a souvenir when I left. I'd show it to you, but only it's too soon to take the bandages off. <laughs> Dorothy Lamour went up to the Army camp with me, and you should have seen Dorothy with those 7,000 men. You should have seen her. I didn't. <laughs> Dorothy left one of her sarongs up there as a souvenir. I don't know who got it, but that ain't a pup tent the general's sleeping under. <laughs> <laughs> of course, romance is in the air at this time of the year. You can tell June is here. All the girls in Hollywood are sending out their trousseaus to be cleaned and pressed. <laughs> Again. And everybody's a... Uh, every... <laughs> that was a sneaky little word, wasn't it? <laughs> And everybody's getting married. I saw a car driving up the street with a pair of shoes sticking out behind it. I said to the driver, wedding? He said, no, pedestrian. <laughs> I, I went to a wedding the other day. It was a typical Hollywood wedding. The bride looked beautiful. She was wearing a long, weight, long white veil. <laughs> so long, you could hardly see her slacks. It was a beautiful thing. <laughs> and the groom was so nervous, his beret fell off. The bride was one of those Hollywood glamour girls. She cut the wedding cake with her fingernails. <laughs> and, and the groom was a musician. What a romance they had. He met her during a hot break in the Hut Sut song. <laughs> and what a wedding. What a wedding. The bride was carrying four roses rather well. And... <laughs> And the bride's mother and father walked down the aisle with her. It's just like a convoy. <laughs> it's a pleasure to protect the merchandise. Just the same, you're awfully happy to get rid of it. <laughs> but it was a lovely spectacle. Two little girls ran in front of the bride, unrolling the red carpet. When they got it all unrolled, there was a groom. <laughs> but romance is everywhere this month. I went down the beach the other day. The ocean was beautiful. All morning, the surf was glistening with foamy white caps. Then Cecil B. DeMille took his box of Lux and went home. <laughs> And what a crowd at the beach A lot of people, you know, change into their bathing suits in their cars 
And I think it's disgusting when it's so much easier in the bus. <laughs> and gee, the new bathing suits the girls are wearing. Aren't they? <laughs> Boy, what girls? What strapless bathing suits? What confidence? <laughs> A lot of beautiful girls were there swimming, but Betty Grable beat them all to the raft. And you should see... <laughs> And you should see Skinny Ennis in the bathing suit. You know the picture on those ads that say before and after? Skinny looks like the one that says not yet. <laughs> Skinny was wearing a nice white bathing suit. Later on, we found out it was a piece of spaghetti with armholes. <laughs> but I want to tell you, Skinny can dive. He did a beautiful swan dive with his arms stretched out, but he got nervous when he started to gain altitude. <laughs> Say, Bill, Bill Goodman, come here. Yes, Bob. Say, gee, we had a swell time at the beach this weekend, didn't we? Yeah, and I thought I was dressed exceptionally well for the beach. Why, when I walked out and took off my robe, did you see everybody crowd around me? Well, after all, Bob, Ermine's short. <laughs> but there certainly were a bunch of pretty girls on that beach. Yeah, Bill, and the way you stared at them, you should have seen how far your eyes popped out. Well, maybe they popped out a little. A little. Bill, one of your bags turn under your... I'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> Just pop mine out a little here. I guess maybe my eyes did pop out a little bit. Thank you for the feed. A little Bill. <laughs> Bill, one of the bags under your eyes turned to the other and said, We'd better get packed. It looks like they're leaving for the weekend. <laughs> Bob, I'm sorry to say this, but you know, I don't like going to the beach with you. You're, you're too much of an exhibitionist, pretending you were drowning. Bill, I wasn't pretending. I was really drowning. Well, all right, but you didn't have to yell, help, help, see the road to Zanzibar, help. <laughs> hey, Bill, did you see Skinny Ennis lying on the beach? Yes, I did. And lying on the beach that way, Skinny looked like a picture. Yeah, no blood and sand. <laughs> I want to tell you, there's one man in this program that knows all about swimming, Professor Colonna. Oh, Professor. Coming. Sneakers. <laughs> that did it. Professor, on second thought, I don't see why I should ask you to give our listeners health and swimming hints. You don't seem to have much of a physique. Now, hold on there, Hope. You can't speak about my physique like that. Did you ever see me in a bathing suit? Yes, I've seen you in a bathing suit. Roly-poly, son of a gun, ain't I? <laughs> well, tell me, Professor, when you get into the water, can you swim far? No, after I swim a, swim a few feet, the faucet hits me in the head. <laughs> <laughs> you have gum trouble tonight yourself, huh? Well, have you ever been in over your head, Kelowna? Yes. What happened? The Bank of America gave me an extension. Now, just to show you what a great swimmer I am, I'll, watch, I'll climb up this 50-foot pole for my famous dive. <laughs> Here I am. <laughs> but, Professor, what are you going to dive into? Into that cup of coffee. You mean you're going to dive 50 feet into a cup of coffee? Yes, sir. Here goes. <laughs> what do you know? No cream. <laughs> <laughs> Look, Kelowna. Kelowna, why don't you take a powder? I will if it's Pepsodent. <laughs> Here's a kid that'll be working next year. <laughs> yes, sir, and Pepsodent tooth powder will be working next year and for years to come to make your teeth brighter. Listen to this. Pepsodent tooth powder has the power to produce a luster on teeth twice as bright as the average of all other leading brands. Now, there's a statement that means something. Because it has the backing of several important and authoritative testing laboratories, which conducted tests on all the leading tooth powders. After they finished testing, they all agreed to that statement. It's your proof that Pepsodent tooth powder is the one for you. Well, that is, if you really want your teeth to sparkle and gleam as they never did before. Right you are, Bill, right. For Pepsodent, with patented composite metaphosphate, can make your smile twice as bright, twice as effective when you turn it on. So, friends, if you're hiding a dull, tight-lipped smile, here's the way to get straightened out. Go to your store now. It's not too late tonight. Go right up to that man and say, I want that tooth powder that beats the others by a mile. I'm fixing up a bright new smile. Give me a package of that high-polished Pepsodent tooth powder, please. <laughs> Ooh, old rock 
rocking chair's got me chained by my side. Hand me that shawl, son, for I tan your hide. Can't get from this cabin. Ain't going nowhere. Up in heaven she be Send me sweet chariot Cause the end of trouble I see Old rocking chair's got me Judgment day is near Chained to my rocking chair an old rocking chair where I belong. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce a very fine actor and the toughest guy on the screen, recently seen in Warner Brothers' High Sierra and the wagons roll at night, Humphrey Bogart. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Uh, I'm glad to see you get down off that mountain all right, Humphrey. <laughs> uh, just a minute, just a minute, Hope. My pals call me Bogey. What do the fellows on this program call you? <laughs> There must be some way to answer that and still stay on the air. <laughs> oh, pardon me if I'm a little nervous around you, Humphrey. You're so tough. You know, when you walk down the street, the people run into their houses. Yeah, and then you come on the air and they run right out again. <laughs> Just a minute, Bogart. You can't talk to me that What's way. What's that? What's that? What'd you say? I don't know. I wasn't listening. <laughs> but I'm warning you, Humphrey, don't fool around with me. Why? Do you carry a gun? You see this hip? Yeah. What about it? Bulges, doesn't it? <laughs> Wait a minute, don't reach for your rod. <laughs> no, I was just kidding, Bob. All I got in my pocket is a, is a handkerchief. I still think it's a gun. No, it's a handkerchief. Watch. I'll use it. Bad cold. <laughs> hey, huh? You know, two weeks ago, we had your co-worker, Priscilla Lane, on this program. She just finished a new picture at Warner Brothers. A half a million dollar baby. Oh, now, wait a minute, Bob. Not a half a million. The name of the picture is Million Dollar Baby. You mean it was before the tax. Say, tell me, <laughs> tell me, Bogey, what picture did you just make over there? Uh, I made a picture called The Wagons Roll at Night. Oh, you mean like Crosby's Horses? But you're so... <laughs> oh, I had a killer in this. <laughs> oh, for that Norman anything. But you're so tough in your pictures. Tell me, Humphrey, were you always a mug? Oh, no, I was the nicest boy in my neighborhood. I always went to school dressed in my cute little Lord Fauntleroy suit, and when I walked down the street, all the neighbors would point at me and say, there's a little rat who blew up the pool room. <laughs> Say, I was a tough kid, too. In school, I used to make spitballs and throw them all around the room. No, you did? You did? Me, too. It only took me a half an hour to make a spitball. Well, I could make one in a minute. You mean you didn't wait for the cement to harden? <laughs> Humphrey, you're just a mug at heart. You're the kind of guy who would put a mustache in the Mona Lisa. Oh, no, no, not me. If he can't raise his own, I'm not going to help him. <laughs> Well, I've watched you a lot in pictures, Humphrey. Tell me, doesn't it make your flesh crawl when you stand there pumping bullets into guys, sticking knives into guys' backs, putting guys in wet cement and tossing them in the river? Oh, no, don't bother me at all. I, I go right home and sleep like a log if a fuse don't blow. <laughs> if a fuse don't blow? Well, good gracious, you didn't expect me to sleep with the light out. <laughs> No, Bob. <laughs> you know, Bob, everybody thinks I'm tough, but I'm, I'm not really tough at all. In the evenings, I, I like to get out in my rock garden. You've got a rock garden? Yeah, sure I have. I get the seeds from the government. 
Say, my brother's in a rock garden under government supervision, too. <laughs> yeah, he is? Yeah. What does he grow? A little older each year. <laughs> Tell me, are you going to keep making those gangster pictures over Warner Brothers with George Raft? <laughs> yes. As a, as a matter of fact, George Raft and I would like to have Skinny Ennis in our next picture with us. Why? What good would Skinny Ennis be in a prison cell? Well, we could pick the lock with him. <laughs> Well, I'll call Skinny over here and have him meet you. Hey, Skinny, come here. Hiya, fellas. Skinny, this is Humphrey Bogart. Well, shut my mouth. Shut my mouth. Be careful, Skin. This guy will do it. <laughs> Hiya, Skinny. Hiya, big shot. What do you have from the mob? Get a load of public adrenaline, number one. <laughs> oh, Bob, me and Bogey come from the same neck of the wood. Is that so? Where were you born, Skin? Ah, uh, he wasn't born a St. Bernard. Dug him up. <laughs> yeah, hold on now. Maybe I don't look like so much on the surface. But, man, when you look a little further, you'll find I'm really nothing. <laughs> you did it. By the way, Skin, how's your girl? Oh, she's getting awful hard to handle. Ah, listen, Skinny, I'll help you. There are two ways to handle a woman. Either you treat her very gently or you treat her very rough. Well, which is the better method? Neither. Whichever you use, they still like a guy who owns a Cadillac. <laughs> well, Skinny, you ought to handle your women like Humphrey does. Assert yourself. I do. Well, only the other day, I looked my girl in the eye and I said, Woman, you're my woman. And you gotta do exactly as I tell you. Did that make an impression on her? I guess so. She laughed so hard, I fell off a lap. <laughs> <laughs> well, is your girl here tonight, Skin? Yeah, Bob, I'll call her. Hey, Magnolia. Come in, come in, honey. Oh, hi, y'all. Well, shut my mouth if it isn't Magnolia. Oh, Mr. Ho, well, shut my mouth. And this is Mr. Bogart. Shut my mouth. And what a business I could do in zippers. <laughs> oh, honest, are you the big bad man that's in the movie? That's what they tell me, yep. Well, shut my mouth and pull it way down over my chin. <laughs> I, uh, I would, but I see somebody beat me to it. <laughs> say, you better be careful what you say to her, Humphrey. Skinny worships the ground she crawled out of. <laughs> Humphrey Bogart, uh, the rat who forces his attentions on girls and makes them kiss him and kiss him and kiss him and until the poor things are almost unconscious. That's me. See, Skinny, that's what I mean. <laughs> oh, so you finally got around to speaking to me, huh? Oh, I didn't mean to neglect you. How are you, honey lamb? Oh, he's just fine. How do you know? He's using my blood today. <laughs> hey. Isn't Mr. Bogart a tough-looking guy? Oh, he's not so tough. Oh, no? No. I dare you to knock this chip off my shoulder. Magnolia, let me down. <laughs> oh, gosh, Mr. Bogart. I wish Skinny could kiss like you. Oh, well, what's wrong with Skinny? Does he give you the fatherly kiss or the brotherly kiss or the real sweetheart's kiss? <laughs> well, I don't know. Which is the one where I have to bend down and pick him up after it's all over? <laughs> hey, see... You see, Skinny's the weaker type. I'll show you how to kiss her, Skinny. Come here, Dame, and throw your arms around me. I will not. Oh, uh, no, I'll show you who's boss around here. That'll show you, and I'll let me down. <laughs> Thank you, Humphrey Bogart, and you'll be back with us in a few minutes, folks. Take it, Skinny. Keep your thumbs up What's an elegant way To greet a new day that comes up Just keep your thumbs up Don't be Humpty Dumpty When you take a fall Pull yourself together And climb back again On the wall with thumbs up That's a very good sign That everything's fine and dandy So come what may today Raise your voice and shout you may be down, but you'll never be out of luck If you keep your thumbs up
together. Climb back up again on the wall with thumbs up, dog. That's a very good sign that everything's fine and dandy. So come what may today, raise your voice and shout. You may be down, but you'll never be out of luck. Oh, if you keep your thumbs up. Very good sign that everything's fine and dandy. So come what may today, raise your voice and shout. You may be down, but you'll never be out of luck. If you keep your thumbs up. Thumbs up. Sing and keep your thumbs up. singing thumbs up. Boy, wasn't that a swell solo, Bill? Oh, no, that wasn't a solo, Bob. That was a duet by me and Skinny. Duet? I didn't hear your voice, Bill. Oh, I don't sing. I just hold Skinny up to the microphone. <laughs> yeah, you stop kidding me, Bill Goodwin. I'm getting sick and tired of this. I got a good mind to wail into you and just tear you apart. You hear me? I'll tear you apart. Man, I got to lay off them double malted. <laughs> Well, now, take it easy, Skin, and, and you stick to those double mullets, too. Anytime you can get double value, that's money in the bank. Look at the new Pepsodent 50 Tough Toothbrush. There's a good example. And Art Baker's the man who can prove it. Yes, the new Pepsodent Toothbrush has 50 tufts of marvelous DuPont Fibrex bristles, twice as many in a small, compact head as in any other brush. You know what that means? Double the number of tufts, double cleansing power. You see, the bristles in the new Pepsodent 50 Tough Toothbrush are gentler. They're kinder to your gums. They don't have to be stiff and harsh because they depend on union for their strength. 50 Tufts united for strength, yet gentle for a better feel in your mouth. You don't have to break in this brush at the expense of tender gums. No, sir. You just open the sanitary glass tube it comes packed in. You grasp that handsome form-fitting colored handle... You add Pepsodent tooth powder, and then you have the grandest feeling, the most thoroughly effective tooth cleaning combination in the world. So get a new Pepsodent 50 Tough Toothbrush tonight at your favorite store. It's the same price as ordinary brushes, just 50 cents. But what a whale of a difference in the results you get. Get a Pepsodent 50 Tough Toothbrush tonight. <laughs> Well, Bogey, here we are in this prison cell. Steel bars all around us, 14 feet of concrete in the walls, 200 guards outside with submachine guns, handcuffs on our wrists, and a steel ball and chain on each of our feet. Yeah, pal. You know something? What? I think they got us. <laughs> well, I don't like it here. It's your own fault that you're in jail trying to spend that phony dollar bill that your brother made. Well, gee whiz, no one would have known it was counterfeit, only brother is such a sentimentalist. Yeah, but it was the first time I ever saw a dollar bill with George Washington dressed as a June bride. <laughs> Gee, I wish we could escape. Yeah, so do I. Say, you broke out of this jail once, didn't you? Yeah, but they caught me all on account of that big searchlight. Well, did they flash the searchlight on you when you went over the wall? Yeah, and like a dope, I took a bow. <laughs> Gee, you know this prison is off. Yeah! I can't stand it. Every day, bread and water, bread and water, bread and water. <laughs> I can't stand it. Well, why not? Well, gee whiz, can't I have just one piece of Melba toast? <laughs> Say, listen, Bogey, we got to get out of here. My trustworthy pal, Professor Colon, is going to help us escape. I think he's on the outside now. Hope. Hope. Yes. Are you locked in the cell? Steel bars all around? Manacles, hand and foot? That's right, Colonna. What do you do when you have a bite? <laughs> hey, Professor Hey, Professor Have you got the tools to help us escape? Yes, I'm baking them in a the cake right now I'd better see if that cake is done I'll pitch it <laughs> Hostess cake <laughs> Kelowna, hurry and get us out of here Listen, Hope Why are you so anxious to get out of jail? Well, since I've been in jail I've been hearing queer rumors I hear that someone's trying to get my job with Pepsi And that someone's been making calls to Shanghai on my phone and throwing wild parties at my house and that someone's been taking my girl out every night. Ah, yes. I've been a busy little bee, haven't I? <laughs> oh, Kelowna, you, you go to my head. No, I was there yesterday and there was nobody home. <laughs> Bogey, 
Cologne will never get us out of here. We gotta make the best of it. Gee, all we got is one pack of cigarettes. How long are we in for? 99 years. You think we need some more cigarettes? No, these are the slower burning kind. <laughs> you know, Humphrey, my dear old Ma was supposed to come and visit me here today. Gee, I hope she can make it. It's a long walk from her cell. <laughs> hello, Dot. Oh, hello, Ma. Why, Mother, let me look at you. Is your hair turning gray? No, I just had a big beer with a lot of foam on it. <laughs> Hey, hey, why didn't you bring Junior with you? I don't see him around anymore. No, the parole board picked up his option. <laughs> Say, Ma, how's Paul? They hung him a few days ago. Oh, well, I thought they hung him last Thursday. They did, but they cut him down so he could hear Rudy Ballet. <laughs> did, they, uh, did they hang him right after that? Yep. Him and Rudy signed off at the same time. <laughs> I'm signing too. So long, son. So long, Ma. So long. so long. Oh, the last mile. It's terrible. That last mile. Oh, that last mile. Gee, is he going to be electrocuted? No, he went for a drive on Decoration Day. <laughs> I'll be with you in a minute, but first I'm going to do a good deed. I'm rescuing someone right from the electric chair. Colonna, Colonna, don't try to rescue anyone from the electric chair. The current may be on. It's all right. I'll just grab him out quick. Well, I always wanted to see how I'd look with my head up. <laughs> hey, Bob. Yeah. Hey, Bob. What's going on in the next cell there? Why, they're giving the third degree to Mendel the mug. I won't talk. <coughs> Ouch. I won't tell you. Ouch. I won't tell you. Gee. That guy must have a pretty important secret. Yeah, he knows all the words to the Hut's Hut song. <laughs> oh, me, oh, my, oh, my, oh, me. Here I am, fellas, and drink is my curse. You know, I've had so many martinis, I'm breaking out in small olives. <laughs> hey, uh, hey, Andy Knox. What are you doing here? What am I doing? Well, how do you like that? They put me in jail for being drunk. Me, who's absolutely sober. Sober with a capital sobe. <laughs> You're sober? Sure I am, but they're giving me the drinker's test, see? The drinker's test? Yeah, I got to sit at one end of the table, and at the other end of the table is a bottle of scotch. Now, I've been sitting there all afternoon, and the question is whether I went over and took a drink or not. I see. Yes, sir, that's the question. <laughs> And that's the answer. Say, <laughs> come here. Say, Canadian Club, what are you in jail for? Oh, I gotta confess, Mr. Hope, I did a terrible thing. A horrible thing. I killed a midget. You, you, you killed a midget? Yes. That's an awful thing to do. How'd you kill him? Oh, the poor little fella, when they think of his eyes, he drowned. <laughs> He did. It was my fault, too. Well, how was it your fault? Well, there was a fly in my beer, and just kidding. I told him it was the seaplane for Hawaii. <laughs> hey, Bob. Bob, I don't know why they let drunks in this jail. Neither do I. Why don't they stay in their cars where they belong? <laughs> Say, Hope, still in jail? Yes. Tight little script, isn't it? <laughs> Come on, Kelowna. How are you going to get us out of this jail? Well, I'm up above you on the roof. I shall drop a rope down past your window. Then the three of us will slide down the rope when I count three. Let me get this straight, Kelowna. You're up there on the roof. You're going to dro drop a rope down past our window. Then the three of us will slide down the rope when you count three. That's right. Ready? One, two, three. <laughs> Kelowna, what happened? We all fell down. Even the rope fell down. Didn't you have the rope tied securely? Sure, look. It's still around my waist. Good night to all Who tune our humor hall Our thanks For dialing in The cast and crew All send their best to you Till next time that we begin. Thanks, Humphrey Bogart. Your art with a villain's part held us from the start to the end. Use Pepsodent Poke. It's 
I should stick to the Hut Sut song. Next Tuesday night, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be broadcasting from La Jolla, California. We're all going down to Camp Callan and entertain the boys with the Coast Artillery. And boy, we're going to have Birth of the Blues. Mary Martin will be with us to sing for the boys. And believe me, they'll like Mary Martin down there. So until next week, this is Bob Hope. Yes, sir. And Bob, I understand next week, by the way, next Monday, in fact, you'll be on the Lux Radio Theater with Carol Lombard. Yeah, we're right? going to do Mr. and Mrs. Smith for old Cecil B. DeMille. I think we'll have a lot of fun there. Wonderful, Bob. Good night. This is Bill Goodman speaking for President. It's the National Broadcasting Company. It's half past eight. Half past eight. It's half past eight, New York time. Time to wake up America and stump the experts. Each week at this time, Lucky Strike challenges you to match your wits against those of a quartet of know-it-alls. For every question we use, Lucky Strike pays out ten dollars plus a copy of the new Information Please quiz book. If your question stumps us, you get twenty-five dollars more plus a twenty-four volume set of the Encyclopedia Britannica. Send your questions to Information Please, 480 Lexington Avenue, New York City. If our editorial staff edits your questions a bit, don't fret over it. In case of similarity, we'll have to be sole judge of who shall be paid, and all questions become the property of Information Please. And now light up a lucky strike as I present our Master of Ceremonies, the literary critic of the New Yorker magazine, Clifton Fadiman. Mr. Fadiman. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen... We proceed as usual, entirely unrehearsed and spontaneously. And before I introduce our experts this evening, I'd like to make an extra special announcement. This coming Wednesday evening only, at 9 o'clock New York time, Information Please will put on a special performance for the Treasury Department, helping to start their new radio series, Millions for Defense. Our Friday night broadcasts, of course, will continue as usual. Now, tonight, our three regulars are the New York Post's Cunning Tower man, Franklin P. Adams, the learned sports authority, John Kieran, and the versatile music master, Oscar Levant. And our guest is the world-famous director of the motion pictures Rebecca and the Lady Vanishes, Mr. Alfred Hitchcock, whose latest picture, Before the Fact, will be released soon. Remember, for each question that's missed, Lucky Strike rings up $25. And that's paid out to the sender, plus 24 volumes of the Encyclopedia Britannica. We're off with a question that comes from Gene Stark of Danbury, Connecticut, who apparently is familiar with the fact that Mr. Hitchcock has some reputation as a trencherman. I'm going to ask you to differentiate gourmet, glutton, and gourmand. Gourmet, glutton, and gourmand. Mr. Hitchcock. I would say that a gourmet is a man who has fine taste in food, a gourmand, the same man who likes a lot of it, and a glutton who just eats food. <laughs> That's short and extremely sweet. And uh, how would you uh, place yourself, uh, Mr. Hitchcock, <laughs> uh, as one of those three, or maybe all three? Well, shall I say for lunch, I'm a gourmet, but for dinner, I'm a gourmand. <laughs> <laughs> Very well put. And uh, you don't have any breakfast? <laughs> Only on Sunday, then I'm Only Mr. on Glutton. Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is a uh, perfect answer and a perfect score for Mr. Hitchcock to begin his information please career with. How about this one from Elizabeth Hamilton of Brooklyn, New York? Get two out of three. Now, of the following plays or motion pictures, I'm going to name three, each represents an innovation in some particular field. What was it in each case? Now, the first is The Great God Brown. That's a play by Eugene O'Neill. Uh, what innovation in its field did that represent? Mr. Levant. Great God Brown. That was by O'Neill. Right. And uh, wasn't there... Uh, there was a scene, or a love scene, I'm not sure, uh, uh, about racial differences. Is that right? No, that's not what I'm after. Mr. Mask Al stuff. Mask right. stuff. Uh, more specifically, what did the masks mean, Mr. Uh, the mask, uh, as I recall it, meant uh, how the man uh, uh, wanted to look and then how he really looked. Yeah, so he hides his true self behind the mask that he turns to the world. And uh, they kept on taking these masks on and off all during the, the play until you didn't know just exactly what you were looking at, which I suppose represents a considerable innovation. That's Might quite right. Might you arrest Mr. Uh, Levant th to know that that was played by Mr. William Harrigan? Remember that, Mr. Levant? No, and it doesn't interest me. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing like a little gracious conversation to start <laughs> the evening off with. <laughs> now, how about the, the cabinet of Dr. Caligari? What innovation, Mr. Hitchcock? Uh, building the scenery 
as though from the mind of a madman. Yes. Has it ever been used uh, since, Mr. Hitchcock? I think not. Uh, not that I know of. So apparently it was an innovation that just well, didn't take. You yes. have to have madmen in your picture to uh, well, allow today you to we the do, innovation. We do the same thing by trick photography. It's simpler and perhaps less expensive that well, way? Absolutely. Very good. Now, how about uh, Becky Sharp, the movie Becky Sharp? Uh, Mr. Hitchcock again. I think they used a new form of Technicolor for the first time. Yes, it was If the first... I remember rightly, there was an excess of powder blue. <laughs> you have a very good memory. I wouldn't know. Mr. Levant had his hand up, and I think was going to say the same thing. The first complete picture using Technicolor. Not only say the same thing, I was asked to buy the stock. <laughs> and that's why you're working for us now, I guess. Uh, here's one from S.D. Levin of Hollis, New York. Oh, just fool around with us, boys. I want you to construct a fairly complete human body out of movie and play titles. You don't have to begin with a head if you don't wish, but let's see if we can get some movie and play titles, each of which contains some part of the body. Mr. Levant. The Years by Virginia Woolf. Oh, oh isn't that nice? Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Uh, all right, now we've got two sets, uh, two ears. Mr. Adams, next. Arms and the Man. Arms and the Man. That gives us a pair of arms. Mr. Kieran. And the Man. <laughs> well, should we stop, uh, Mr. Adams? Uh, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> <laughs> let's get a few more, Mr. Kieran. Three Faces East. Three Faces East. That's very good. Uh, Mr. Levant again. Chu Chin Chow. Chu Chin... <laughs> say, that's very good. That's very good. Uh, how about uh, Back to Methuselah? Might be one. Uh, any others you can think of? Uh, moon Calf. Calf, yes. Moon Calf. Very good. Uh, Mr. Adams. Uncle Tom's Cabin. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll stop on that, Mr. Adams, if it's all right with you. <laughs> There's a new movie being made by RKO called think... Unexpected Ankle. There was one, The Similar. Unexpected Ankle. Yeah. He's playing straight man to you tonight, Mr. Adams. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Hitchcock. Now, here's one from Phyllis Tucker of New York City. I haven't stumped any of you gentlemen yet. In his speech of last Sunday, Winston Churchill named what he called four climacterics of the war. Give three of them. Mr. Levant. Uh, the fall of France? That's quite right. The lease lend bill? That's quite right. And what happened last Sunday or Saturday? Uh, the Russian was? invasion or counterattack, whichever phrase yeah, you like. The, the, the uh, Russian. That gives us three. Now, there's one more. Well, you only asked for three. I know. You're all right. You've got us over the rapids, Mr. Mm -hmm. Levant. But I wonder whether you can remember the other. Munich. No, the Battle of Britain in the air uh, of last September, uh, which uh, at least temporarily uh, proved that the Germans were not supreme in the air. That's right. That gives us four out of four. Now, how about this one from C.A. Pairs of uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts? Get two out of three. Identify these scenes of suspense in literature or the movies. I think Mr. Hitchcock is famous for his magnificent manipulation of scenes of suspense. And by the way, I don't think any of these uh, have anything to do with pictures that you made yourself, Mr. Hitchcock. Uh, well, in the first case, a wounded man hangs from a cable car. A wounded man hangs from a cable car. What picture? Is that the peril of Pauline? <laughs> no. <laughs> now, it might be. I wouldn't know. I don't go back as far as you do, Mr. Levant. What's a cable car? Cable car. It's one of those... I think it's one of those funicular things that uh, cross chasms and... Uh, cable car? Oh, 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 oh. Got it, Mr. Levant? A picture uh, directed by a disciple. That's what they said in the paper. Mr. Hitchcock called yes. Night... Go ahead. Night... Not train? Go ahead. Yes, Yeah, sure. train. Night train. <laughs> That's right. I remember that. Yes, a very good melodrama with Rex Harrison and Margaret Lockwood. Who directed it? Uh, do you remember Mr. Hitchcock? Yes, um, it was directed by a man called Carol Reed. Unfortunately, I never go to the movies, so I wouldn't have seen it. You don't go to the movies? <laughs> Me no, neither, I'm Mr. Saying. Hitchcock. <laughs> <laughs> well, how do you uh, manage to make any comparisons with the work you do yourself, Mr. Hitchcock? Or don't you care? No, I try no, not don't, to. Just, a man just don't... said to me, if you don't see pictures, where do you get your ideas from? <laughs> <laughs> well, how about this one? You can keep out of this question if you wish, Mr. Hitchcock. It's all right. Uh, in this case, a house teeters on the brink of a precipice. That was a very good scene. Uh, uh, Charlie Chaplin's Gold Rush. You don't think that's a picture, Mr. Hitchcock? Yes. You, oh, you do go to the pictures. house did teeter on the... Uh, yes, that's quite right. And you did go to see that one. That's still life um. to him. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Charlie Chaplin's picture, The Gold Rush. I think that uh, belongs in your category, Mr. That's Reed. the one I saw. That's the, I saw you did. <laughs> well, we're all right so far. Now, how about this one? Nails are slowly driven into the top of a coffin. Nails are driven into the top of a coffin. Uh, Mr. Adams. Escape. That's right. Very yeah, good. I read the book. <laughs> 
Escape, right, with Robert Taylor and Norma Shearer. Well, that gives us three out of three. Here's one from Sherwood Friedman of this city. Uh, you're going to hear some drum beats, a series of four different types of drum beats, and I want you to determine the type of dance music that each represents. Uh, there are four of them. We have to get three out of four. We've never had a question exactly like this. I'm interested to see how well we can do. Well, let's have the first. Uh, Mr. Hitchcock. Rumba. The rumba is right. Yes, very good. Now the second. Mr. Levan. That's a Viennese waltz. Not Absolutely to be confused right. with any other waltz. Absolutely right. Uh, now the third. Mr. Kieran, that wasn't your hand that was raised. No, was it? madam, oh, no, right. son. <laughs> uh, Mr. Levant. I'd say that's a conga version of Emperor Jones. Uh, it's a conga, all right. That's very good. Uh, now the fourth and last. That's nothing. How about that? We're safe. We've got three out of four. Any guesses on that? Want to hear it again? No. All right, then you'll hear it again. Uh, that is. Uh... We'll do one more bar. <laughs> Mr. Hitchcock. Is it the Bolero? It is, Mr. Hitchcock. Thank you very much indeed. That's very good. A Bolero. That gives us four out of four. Uh, which means that so far, Lucky Strike has paid out absolutely nothing and no sets of the Encyclopedia Britannica. Now Mr. Cross points out that knowing the facts about tobacco comes in handy today. Mr. Fadiman, that's because most of us are smoking more in 1941. So, of course, we want a milder cigarette. One made from the lighter, milder tobaccos. Now, tobacco like that costs more than the ordinary kind. Yes, it costs more at auction after auction. But luckies pay the price to get it. For example, last season at Carthage, Tennessee, the American Tobacco Company paid 23% more per pound for the tobacco it bought for its cigarettes and other tobacco products. Yes, 23% above the average market price paid for all the various types and grades of tobacco sold there. And the best we bought will go to luckies. Now, so it goes at market after market. We pay the price to get the finer, naturally milder, better-tasting tobaccos. Mr. Fadiman, have I demonstrated why luckies are in tune with the times? I believe you have, Mr. Cross, and in just 52 seconds. Now, this evening's performance doesn't please me very much. I haven't been able to stump any of you. Hope I can do better during the second half of the program. Here's one from Mrs. Henderson Rogers of Winston-Salem, North Carolina, right in the heart of the Lucky Strike country. Uh, quote at least four lines of poetry in which the poet has made use of the number seven. When I say four lines, I mean four separate and distinct lines in which uh, the word seven is used. Mr. Adams. We are seven. All right. A simple child who lightly draws his breath. Good enough. That's right. Wordsworth's uh, lines of we are seven. That gives us one set of sevens. How about another? Mr. Kieran. Well, uh, I believe it was uh, Gene Inglow wrote a whole series of poems, seven times one or seven and so forth. Child's poem? Yes, they're rather uh, nursery mm -hmm. style. All right, good enough. That gives us two. Uh, Mr. Levant? Seven come eleven, I'm going to heaven or something like That's that? That's perfectly good. A classic couplet, come seven, come eleven. I don't know what I'd call it poetry. Uh, Mr. Kieran? If one were, though one were strong as seven, he too with death would dwell. That's from Swinburne. Gee, I don't know that one. The uh, Garden of Proserpina. Very sin, good. Sins which are 70 times seven. That's right. <clears throat> well, that gives us uh, three or four. There's a uh, one from the walrus and the carpenter. About it's seven maids with seven mops. That's right. Swept it for half a year. That's right. And there's a uh, famous one from Mother Goose about the St. Ives incident. Remember that? I met a... Man, man with, with seven, seven wives. wives. And it goes on with a great many other seven. That's perhaps not a very difficult one. How about this one from Richard Ahern of New York City? How does each of these figure in fact or fiction? Rickshaw, Bradshaw, Earnshaw, Hawkshaw. We have four Shaws. Uh, Mr. Hitchcock, want to start us off? Um, Hawkshaw was a fiction character. Rickshaw uh, was a... Hawkshaw was a fiction character. What uh, part did he play? A detective. What? A detective, a detective, yes. detective. Uh, Rickshaw is a, 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 an oriental two-wheeled vehicle. Well, how does it uh, occur in literature? Oh, I beg your pardon. Kipling. Uh, Kipling, Mr. Adams, that's right. Rickshaw. The Phantom Rickshaw, as Mr. Levant reminds us. Yes, a famous story. That gives us Rickshaw and Hawkshaw. How about Bradshaw and Earnshaw, Mr. Levant? Earnshaw was a pitcher on the Philadelphia Athletics. Well, I, I can't help that. He was that. very good. Uh, all right, all right. Perfectly okay. He figures, in fact. 
Now, there's another Earnshaw that figures in fiction. Probably uh, not as good. I uh, Mr. Adams? I, I was thinking of the baseball player. It's the only one I ever heard of. We've had him. Uh, what do you the want only Earnshaw I know. Bradshaw is a railroad guide. Right. What country? England. In England. England, that's right. Well, there is an Earnshaw who figures in fiction. There's an Earnshaw in one of those English novels. Yes. Yeah, so which one? It's there a wide many. field, Mr. There aren't Chair. many. Uh, <laughs> no, it's one of those... Uh, uh, horror, Bronte. Horror novels. Yes, you're all right, Mr. Adams. Which one? Wuthering Heights. Uh, that's right, Mr. Kieran. Wuthering Heights. Uh, Kathy Earnshaw in Wuthering Heights. Well, that finishes the Shaws. What's a kick show, by the way? Anybody Kelka know? shows. It comes from the French Kelka shows. I never expected. Wonderful, Mr. How about Chairman? G.B.? We, we should mention him, yes. G.B. Shaw, uh, Rick Shaw, Brad Shaw, Earnshaw. I think that cleans up with the Shaw business. Now, how Irwin about this Shaw. one? From Condon Riley of Springfield, Massachusetts. Here's a motion picture. Uh, come music question. Get two out of three. In what motion picture did you hear each of these musical selections that are important to the plot? And get two out of three. Let's have the first. Uh, Mr. Levan had his hand up at once. Charlie Chaplin in The Dictator. Yes, in The Dictator. He's getting shaved, I think. Yes, to the strains of what? To the Brahms Fifth Hungarian Dance. a boy. Incidentally, uh, almost three or four out of the New York moving picture critics called it the List Hungarian Rhapsody. Did they? Yes. Oh, goodness. <laughs> I don't suppose you even remember who the fourth was. Well, one of them's listening in. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, see what you can do with the next. Now we have uh, Mr. Levant again. Mr. Kieran looking a little quizzical. Sounds to me as though I heard Paderewski play that. Uh, no, you didn't. Well, that may be. But no, I don't think it, it may be. I don't think in a motion picture. Mr. Kier, Mr. Levant. I want to correct you. Paderewski did never play it. He did never play it. You correct me now. All right. He did not <laughs> never play it, Mr. Kieran. He never played it. He never played no, it. No, it's the Ninth Symphony. What picture? I don't know. Ninth it's the last right. moment, the Ode to Joy. Uh, any ideas? I have no ideas. No ideas at all. No. Any guesses, gentlemen? We really have to get the picture. The picture is Meet John Doe. Well, now you it, got it. Remember it now? No, I remember the picture, but not the ninth uh, Well, uh, just as the Doe was about to jump off the building, I, I didn't see the picture. I don't remember. But apparently at that point, uh, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony... Well, it stopped him. I'll say that. I have to call that wrong. Now I have to get the next one right. Tchaikovsky, B-flat concerto. Good enough. And the picture? The picture was the great line, which Mary Astor gave a very good portrayal of a very nervous pianist. That's very good, Mr. Levant. I don't think very many people would remember that. Why? That's, it's that's all the way going. through the picture. Is it really? All the way through. Which you might have to see in order to answer. That's you pretty afford? snobbish, Mr. <laughs> Adams. Well, that gives us uh, two out of three <laughs> and passes us safely <laughs> on to a How question. About you, stuff? <laughs> boys, boys, control yourselves. Uh, here's one from Amelia Edgerton of New York City. For what famous uh, artist did each of these women model? Uh, the first is Lucrezia. For whom did she model? Lucrezia. Famous uh, artist. Was that before unions? Uh, this is a long... Yes, it's well, before that George White. Be, uh, that would have to be uh, probably either Raphael or Michelangelo. No, not necessarily. Hmm. No, the uh, famous Italian painter Andrea del Sarto oh, yes. had uh, a sort of a combination model here, Lucrezio, acted as his wife also. <laughs> she appears in the poem Andrea del Sarto by Browning, Mr. Kieran. Do you happen to recollect that? The faultless painter. Uh, that's right. That gives us one wrong, however. And now, uh, for whom did Lady Hamilton model? Uh, Mr. Hitchcock? Uh, Romney. George Romney, yes. The English artist George Romney. And for whom did Saskia model? Saskia, S-A-S-K-I-A. -S -S Sounds like a trade name. Uh, any ideas? Who was around in those days? Well, this was uh, sort of 17th century-ish. Oh, that wouldn't be the Dutch painter, would it? Which one? Yeah, there's only one real wonderful... Go ahead, John. Tell him the Dutch Rembrandt. painter. Uh, yeah. Yes, Rembrandt is right. She was mm -hmm. both the wife and model of Rembrandt. That's quite right. That gives us two out of three. Now, here's one from Jack Lozato of this city. Can you tell who in literature consumed these enormous quantities of food. Uh, I think we ought to get all on this. Uh, who consumed the milk exclusively provided for him by a herd of 17,913 cows? Mr. Curran. Gargantua. Gargantua. Uh, that's right. Uh, during what period of Gargantua's life? Did he when he was a child. When he, he did was a better when child. he grew up. <laughs> yes. He just trained on, on the milk of 17,000 and so forth cows. 
And where will you find the story of Gargantua, Mr. Kieran? In Gargantua and Pantagruel. Yes. By whom? Dean Rabelais. Swift. Rabelais. No, Whoa. I think not, Mr. Adam. Now, how about this one? Uh, who consumed elephants brought to it by its mother? Who consumed elephants brought to it by its mother? This is some going. Uh, these are full-size elephants, gentlemen. What's he doing now? Uh, <laughs> he just, he's just suffering. Uh, well, gentlemen, it's a tough one. It's the mythical animal, the rock, in Sinbad the Sailor. Does that come back to any of you now? Well, that's one wrong. Now, how about this one? Who consumed 20 wagon loads of meat and 10 wagon loads of wine at a meal? Uh, Mr. Kieran. I think that was uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Gulliver. Yes, Dr. Gulliver. In, when uh, he was among the, uh, the uh, uh, Lilliputians. Yes, actually, it would, probably would be just a normal... Uh, just a snack. Uh, <laughs> well, if he hadn't been among the Lilliputians, it would have been a normal or ordinary Hitchcock meal, but as it was, <laughs> it amounted to considerable among the Lilliputians. Well, that gives us uh, one wrong and sends $25 in an encyclopedia to Mr. Lutzato, courtesy of Lucky Strike. How about this one from R. Thorvald Kroc of San Francisco? Get two out of three. Who watches or overhears each of these scenes or incidents? Who uh, overhears uh, their own funeral oration? Their own funeral oration. Mark Twain. Uh, you're on the right track. Well, he made the remark. Uh, no, no, I don't think so. You mean my uh, reports of my death have been exaggerated? Yeah. I don't mean that. But as a matter of fact... Uh, Max uh, Schmeling. Uh, no. <laughs> Certainly. That's true in a way. You mean the... It's true, definitely. Somebody in Huckleberry Finn. Uh, you got the wrong book. Mr. Tom Ed. Sawyer. Yes, right. it's uh, Tom, Joe, and Huck in, Is in Max Tom Schmeling Sawyer. Is Tom Sawyer? Pardon? He's not in Tom Sawyer. I bet he wishes he were. <laughs> uh, the, uh, I think I have to count that wrong, Mr. Adams. Don't you think oh. so? All right, we'll count that wrong. That means I have to get the next two right. Who overhears his stepfather praying? Mr. Kieran. Hamlet, That's Prince the one of and Denmark. Only. That's quite right. And who uh, overhears two women discussing the infidelity of their friend's husband? That's a kind of complicated situation. Who overhears two women discussing the infidelity of their friend's husband? Mr. Adams. Uh, would that be in The Merry Wives of Windsor? No, but a modern version of it. Merry Wives? No. Oh, the women. Women, yes. Yeah. Uh, Claire Luce's Which... play, The Women. And who uh, does the overhearing? Well, everybody in the audience. <laughs> That's true, <laughs> but particularly one on the stage. Oh, the... the... Alleged nice girl, played by sometimes by Norma Shearer. I don't think it was. I think it was oh. uh, the manicurist. Oh, that's right. Oh, she may have been a nice girl, too. I, I'm not saying anything against the manicurist. I think I have to count that wrong and send another $25. And instead of the Britannica, courtesy of Lucky Strike... I guessed everyone right, and you called everyone wrong. No, no, we, uh... Max Schmeling was right, and oh, the no, women didn't over here his actual oration, did he? Oh, I'm sorry, you're right. I mean, he, he was reporting to on the radio. Yeah. But I, I don't think there was a real oration pronounced I withdraw. Over. Impolitely. Mm. <laughs> All right. How about this one? Here's a single part question, gentlemen, from Frank Manley of Detroit. What is the name of the country bounded by the USSR, China, India, and Iran? Uh, Mr. Hitchcock. Turkestan. No, it would not be. Uh, Turkestan, is Turkestan a country, uh, independent country, or even semi-independent, or rather a region, part of the Tibet. USSR? No. Uh, Mr. Kieran. Afghanistan. Afghanistan would be the right answer. You uh, rushed in where Kieran's feared to tread, Mr. Hitchcock, <laughs> and that's going to cost us $25 and a set of the Britannica going out to Mr. Manley. Now, how about this one for Mrs. Joseph Dobos of Bridgeport, Bridgeport, Connecticut? Identify these boy-meets-girl situations in various movies and plays. Get two out of three. In the first case, a rich young man meets a white-collar girl at her father's home in Philadelphia. Mr. Levant. Kitty Foyle. Kitty Foyle, that's right. Now, here's another boy-meets-girl situation. They meet when she sticks her foot out to trip him. When she sticks her foot out to trip him. Oh. Got it, Mr. Yes, uh, Preston Sturge's picture with Barbara Stanwyck and Henry Fonda. That's right. And I don't know the name of the picture. The Lady Eve. That's Thank right. you very much, Mr. Hitchcock and Mr. Levant. The Lady Eve is quite right. And now, in this case, he falls in love with her at a masquerade ball. He falls in love with her at a masquerade ball. Mr. Kieran. Romeo and Juliet. Romeo and Juliet. There's no question about that. Gav gives us three out of three. How about this one? From uh, Mrs. A. Nachman of Brookline, Massachusetts. I'm going to ask you to identify each of these terms that are used in connection with the preparation of food. 
Uh, here's uh, the first phrase, a la creole. A la creole. What would that mean, a la creole, if you saw it on a menu? Uh, Mr. Kieran. Well, it would mean cooked in the southern style or a New Orleans style. Which would mean uh, specifically Probably with a, uh, with a sauce uh, on it. Made out of what? Okra. No, they might use they might use okra in it, Mr. Adams, but more particularly what? Mr. Hitchcock, any ideas on uh, a la creole, Mr. Levant? Well, it all depends where you get it, but it usually has tomatoes and spices and pepper and yes. old things in it. <laughs> not, not necessarily old things, but tomatoes and green peppers. Now, suppose the, you saw something described as a la printanière. A la printanière. That I know. Uh, you do know that, Mr. Levant? That's with vegetables. Yes, with various fresh vegetables. A bouquetier is the uh, same spring thing. Vegetables. <laughs> spring, <laughs> spring, <laughs> spring vegetables, quite right. Uh, greenish, uh, probably, in color. How about maître d'hôtel? What would that mean if you saw it on a menu? Huh. Maître d'hôtel, Mr. Hitchcock. I think it's a, it's a, a butter mixed with parsley. Yes, uh, butter sauce, uh, lemon juice, uh, parsley, salt, and pepper. Uh, that gives us three out of three. Now, how about this one from F. Lewison of New York City? I'm going to ask you to give me the actual names of these famous females. Uh, several of these have been made famous on this program. At least one of them has. First of them is Lady Godiva, Mr. Adams' favorite female. <laughs> uh, what was her real name? If you wanted to look her up in a phone book, Mr. Adams... Uh, what would you look for, uh, Mr. Kieran? Well, she was a lady. She was the wife. I'd look her up in the Coventry book. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, she was a lady of Coventry. And what were you going to say, Mr. Kieran? I was just going to say that's all she was, as far as I know. Yes, lady of Mercia and of Coventry. Now, how about Mona Lisa? She had a real name, Mona Lisa. Mr. Kieran? Uh, La Joconde. Yes. Uh, her full name would be what? Ma- uh, Madame uh, Joconde. Lisa del Joconde. And the third lady of the lamp would be what, Mr. Kieran? Or Mr. Hitchcock? Florence Nightingale. Yes, Florence Nightingale. And now here's a question that Mr. Cross maintains only you smokers can answer. The question, Mr. Fadiman, is simply this. Is it good business for the American Tobacco Company to pay so much above the average market price for tobacco? The answer is yes. Not because we say so, but because millions of you smokers say so every time you step up to a cigarette counter. We pay the price to get the finer, the lighter, the naturally milder tobaccos that make Lucky's a milder, better-tasting cigarette, the kind of a cigarette that gives you more smoking enjoyment. As a result, more and more of you are asking for Lucky's. So you see, it's really the very best of business practices for the American Tobacco Company to pay, for example, 18% more than the market average at Warrington, North Carolina last season, 27% more at Bowling Green, Kentucky, 34% more at Brookneal, Virginia, and so on. Yes, that's good business for us, because it's good smoking for you. Is it any wonder that with independent experts, with men who know tobacco best, it's Lucky's two to one? Next time, why don't you ask for Lucky Strike? Thank you, Mr. Cross. Now, this evening, Lucky Strike has cheerfully paid out the sum of $75 and three sets of the Britannica. One time, I thought we weren't going to pay out anything. It would have been terrible. Lucky Strike thanks you, Mr. Hitchcock, for coming to the party this evening. And next week, uh, Mr. Curran and Mr. Adams will bat them out as usual. But we have a rather unusual pair of guests. The famous foreign correspondents and authors. First, Mr. John Gunther, who has been with us many times before. And secondly, Mr. Walter Durante. Now remember, for every question we use, whether or not it's answered correctly, the sender gets $10. If the question should happen to stump our experts, as three have tonight, you not only get the sum of $25 more, but in addition, the complete 24-volume set of the latest edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica. Remember to send your letters with questions and don't forget to send the correct answers to information, please, 480 Lexington Avenue, New York City. And now, a parting message from Mr. L.A. Speed Riggs, famous tobacco auctioneer from Goldsboro, North Carolina. And that chant, ladies and gentlemen, is just another way of saying that if you haven't tried a lucky lately... You don't know what you're missing. By the way, if you're going visiting this weekend, we suggest that you bring your host or hostess a carton of Luckies. It's sure to make a hit. Remember, with independent tobacco experts, with men who know tobacco best, it's Luckies two to one. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Well, sir, it's a few minutes past eight o'clock as we enter the small house halfway up in the next block now. And here in the living room, we find Mr. and Mrs. Victor Gook spending a quiet evening at home. Vic lounges on the Davenport and gazes dreamily at his shoes. 
Sage is seated in her husband's easy chair beneath the floor lamp, reading aloud from the newspaper. Listen. The bride, leaning heavily upon the arm of her father, was radiant in a going-away costume of off apricot, with stockings and pumps to match, with burnt caramel accessories and a small cloche hat. She carried a bouquet of mixed garden flowers. Out-of-town guests were Cyrus L. Freach of Kansas City, Missouri, a former employer of the groom, Ed and Will Falper, Lexington, Illinois, Mr. and Mrs. U.O. Dimp and Son Walrab of Red Wing, Minnesota, Harry K. Montgomery of West Pittston, Pennsylvania, Mr. and Mrs. Clark Dunlap of Cleveland, Ohio, Mr. and Mrs. Bill Lacey of Toronto, Ontario, Cad Wallader... The uh, telephone is again. One answer. Probably Ruthie somebody. No, I'm sure not. Then let me hazard a guess. It's good old dependable down at the heel, solid concrete foundation, trustworthy Bluetooth Jensen. Yes. Hello? Yes? Why, no, he isn't. Who is this? Oh, uh huh. CD. Huh? Bluetooth Jensen. Oh, really? Good old sweeter than the flowers in May. It matters not who won or lost or how you played the game. Reliable Bluetooth Jensen. You better talk to him, Angie, otherwise he'll hang up. Uh, Bluetooth? How are you, Bluetooth? Glad to hear it. No, Rush ducked out someplace right after supper. Any message I can give him? Oh? Vernon Pagels is out in the lead? Okay. I see. Tomorrow he's going to buy his second United States defense bond up, and that puts him away ahead of the rest of you guys. Uh Uh-huh. Okay, Bluetooth. You bet. Oh, bye. Where is Button Hook, by the way? I haven't any idea. He walked out the kitchen door as soon as he finished wiping the dishes. He can't have gone very far or planned to stay away very long. Otherwise, he'd have said something. Mm. Uh, Cad Wallader J. Urquhart of Twillman, Oklahoma. Oh, what's this? Still reading what the paper states about the wedding. Oh. Uh, Cad Wallader J. Urquhart of Twillman, Oklahoma. Martha, Esther, James, Donald, Arnold, and Eugene Niebel of Indianapolis, Ohio. Mr. and Mrs. Ari Greep of Cincinnati, Indiana. Mrs. William Yocker and infant daughter Rudolphina Margaret Annabelle Beulah of Fishley, Michigan. And J.U. Epson of O'Brien, Texas, a college classmate of the groom. Quite a turnout, hmm? Yeah. Immediately after the ceremony, the guest... Oh, here's Stone, Bruce. Hi. Hi. Immediately after the ceremony, the guests were served to dainty refreshments at the home of Mr. and Mrs. John H. Weeper, 917 South Center Street. Fun loving friends of the happy couple painted humorous signs on their motorcycle and decorated the handlebars with old shoes. Since the motorcycle has no sidecar, the newlyweds rode away, one seated behind the other. Excuse me, people. Hey, hey. Kindly forgive the intrusion. Think no more about it. You live here in the house and are entitled to come and go as you please. Oh. Good old True Blue, heart bigger than all outdoors, reliable old Bluetooth Johnson just phoned. Yeah? He said Vernon Pagels is going to buy his second United States defense bond tomorrow. Oh? That puts him out ahead of everybody. So Bluetooth allowed. I thought I'd better drop in and tell you something, Mom. What's that? Nicer Scott is sitting on his front porch steps. Pretty cold to be doing that, isn't it? I'm going over and pasting one upside the snoot. What's this now? Once more, nicers go to the human body to the point where civilized flesh and blood can't stand it. Has he? He has. And I'm going next door and wang him one upside the bean. Thought I'd better notify you first. Maybe you better sit down. I can't spare the time. Can't take any chances on letting him escape. Any second, he might go in the house. Sit down. Human flesh and blood refuses. Listen, Willie, I'm good and tired of every little while having to go over and over this business. Remember tonight at supper? Nice you're coming in our kitchen and being nice as pie and obliging as a horse? I remember. Axel Grease wouldn't melt in his mouth, would it? He was a fine gentleman with the slick manners, wasn't he? Well, he was certainly a lot. Every second he was in our house, he was casting around his eyes. What do you mean by that? He was looking for stuff. Looking for stuff? Looking for stuff to pin on me. I haven't the slightest notion well, what... Well, he found some stuff to pin on me. What time did we eat supper? Rush, will you kindly... Six if... o'clock, wasn't it? Six o'clock or a few minutes past? Okay. Well, by 7.30, he'd been all over town with his meanness. I think... He strolled me... up to the corner of Kelsey in Virginia. Smelly Clark, Willis Rohrbeck, and Leland Richards were sitting under the streetlight. When they saw me, they let out a screech. Mom, in less than an hour and a half, 
Nature's got it made me an object of ridicule before the human race. You ask him what he's talking about. What's he talking about? It's my knife and fork. Knife and fork? Yeah. I think the weather's done something to the child. What about your knife and fork? When Nicer was in the kitchen the night during supper, he spotted my knife and fork. Vinegar crude old saddle soap. Papa's completely in the dark. Your little knife and fork? My little knife and fork. You have the key to this mystery? You know his little knife and fork he eats with. I eat with him because you put him beside my plate. I always put him beside your plate. Never heard you complain. I never complained because it never occurred to me a snake in the grass like Nicer Scott had used him against me. What did Nicer tell the boys? He told him, Rush Gook eats with a knife and fork a third the size of regular knives and forks. Rush Gook eats with a knife and fork where there's angels engraved all over and darling baby printed on the back. <laughs> Why, that little dickens. He spread it all over town. I'm the miserable object of public ridicule. Why, Biff give him that knife and fork when he was three years old. Mm-hmm. They aren't really baby things. They're smaller than regular knives and forks, but not any two-thirds smaller person would have to look twice to tell the difference. Nicer Scott looked twice. In fact, he must have stood there studying the half-wit knife and fork. He told the guys about the angels engraved all over. Told them about darling baby printed on the back. <laughs> well, I expect he did make it sound funny to the kids. A monstrous great big grown-up high school gentleman, 14 years old, using sweet, dainty little knives He's and made it sound funny and he's had his fun. Now I'm going over and smash his head. Oh, no, you're not. You suggest I leave him get away with this? I suggest you sit still. Right this minute, he's seated on his bottom front porch step. Wouldn't take me four seconds to step over and paste him one upside the snoot. Well, you're not going to do it. Imagine. Come over to our house this evening while we were eating supper. It was all friendship and soft talk and high-class manners. Been a warm day, Miss Gook. You're looking well, Mr. Gook. I see you enjoy jelly on your bread rush. And all the time, his eye was roving around. He spotted my little knife and fork with the angels on it and darling baby printed on the back. He got the details well in mind, then he excused himself and went outdoors and run like the dickens all over town to spread the news. Well, you should have heard the screaming and yelling when I showed up at the corner of Kelsey in Virginia. On a kind of nicer Scott's polite visit this evening, I am now a miserable object of public ridicule. Oh, I doubt if it's that bad. It is that bad. I'm going over and punch his dim-witted jaw. I say you're not. Now, listen, Rush, we've been through this business again and again and again, and you ought to understand by now I hey, don't intend to take again. chances on being on the outs with next-door neighbors. Kids' quarrels is one thing, and grown-up quarrels is another. And I Tell it for you, Tell it for you, Rush. Probably somebody calling up to Josh. Well, me. answer it. You're right there. Gee, wouldn't it be wonderful if it was good old trustworthy love me, love my dog, Mary is a grand old name, reliable Bluetooth Johnson again. Hello? Oh, hello, Leroy. Leroy Snow. Mm-hmm. Mm. What is your business, Leroy? Will you repeat your question, please? No, Leroy, I do not wear a baby bonnet when I go to bed. No, and I don't wear bibs or booties either. Was that all, Leroy? Very well, Leroy. Not at all, Leroy. Any time, Leroy. Only too happy, Leroy. Certainly, Leroy. Depend upon it, Leroy. Now allow me to bid you goodbye, Leroy. Goodbye, Leroy. See? They're just having a little fun at your expense, sir. I'll smash Nicer Scott's chin. Of course, he'll do nothing of the kind. Pete, allow me to tell you a little story about Benjamin Franklin and what he said to his manservant while flying a kite near the city of Philadelphia early in the year 1820. It just so happened this man, the servant's name was Charlie, and there was nothing he liked better than bread with sugar on it. Well, sir, according to history, Benjamin Franklin... Cell phone's ringing. Oh, so it is, by George. If it could only be good old Brown as a berry, even Steve Independent of Bluetooth Johnson. Oh? Oh, yes, Milton. Milton Welsh. Oh. Hmm. What brings you to the telephone, Milton? Hope you didn't disturb me while I was sitting on my father's knee while he sung me to sleep, huh? Not at all, Milton. I assure you, I wasn't sitting on my father's knee being sung sleep. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. You bet. Well, just awful nice of you to call. Yes, indeed. I'll uh, call again sometime, won't you? You bet. Okay, Milton. Sure thing, Milton. Goodbye, Milton. Wonderful stuff. Huh? Uh-huh. <laughs> I will step next door and fix nicer Scott good. No, you won't. Goodness, talk about making the camel's back out of a molehill. What do you care? 
It is kind of halfway comical, a big 14-year-old high school gentleman using a dainty little knife and fork with darling baby on it to eat his supper with. Is it kind of halfway comical, a baboon like Nicer Scott would enter my private home like a wolf in sheep's Why, clothing? sure. You'd probably have done the same thing. I bet if you caught Heine Call across the street eating his supper with a little knife and fork like yours, you... Uh, tell us what it is, Jimmy. I'll get it. Always something, hmm? <laughs> Hello? Yes? Who? I seem to recognize the voice, but I can't quite place it. Mildred? Mildred who, please? Rizdal? Fizdal? Bizdal? T like in time or... Oh, Tisdal. Oh, sure, I recollect you now. Uh, Mildred Tisdal, isn't it? Hey, hey. Hey, hey is right. What is your business, Hildred? I mean, Mildred. Do I feed myself with my little knife and fork, or do my parents do it? Uh-huh. Why, I feed myself, Mildred. Yes. Not at all, and thanks for calling. Certainly. Certainly. Goodbye, Miss Ricedale, or whatever it is. Ah, yes, Gizdo. Goodbye, Miss Gizdo. See, even the girls. Oh, you lead a miserable life. I'll go next door and lock nicer Scott's ears down around his chin. I don't think you will. Listen, you can explain to your friends it was your mother's fault. <laughs> it is, too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I've always thought of that little engraved knife and fork as being what Rush uses to eat with. Year after year, ever since he started eating with knives and forks, I've put them beside his plate. And like I say, they're not actually baby things. They're almost as big as regular knives and forks. When I set the table, I invariably get them out of the drawer and put them beside Willie's plate. It's never crossed my mind I had a grown-up 14-year-old man for a son and was given them knives and forks covered over with angels and marked darling baby. <laughs> <laughs> Silly, huh? <laughs> oh, forgive me, Ashtray. Oh, it's okay, I guess. Is it? <laughs> sure. Begin to see the comical side, huh? <laughs> yeah. Well, where are you going? Upstairs. Read a nice book? Uh-huh. Well, that's fine. Oh. Uh-huh. I'll put your little knife and fork away in the buffet someplace. Okay. Stuff happens, don't it? Yeah. <laughs> Stuff happens. Mm-hmm. Where was I here in my newspaper piece? Mm-hmm. Why, say, I left out a whole paragraph. Did you? List of names. Mm-hmm. Out of towners. Mm-hmm. Mr. and Mrs. David Yasher and sons Chauncey and Beef of Pittsburgh, Iowa. Dwight K. Frapp, Jr., Mulish, Vermont. Sidney, Lila, Hobart, Gus, Vivian, Grace, Howard, and Stungle, Houch. Dismal Seepage, Ohio, and Miller Y. Miller of Itcher, Montana. A real turnout, hmm? Mm. Immediately after the ceremony, the guests were served to dainty refreshments at the home of Mr. and Mrs. John H. Weeper, 917 South Center Street. Fun loving friends of the happy young couple painted humorous signs on their motorcycle and decorated the handlebars with old shoes. Since the motorcycle has no sidecar, the newlyweds rode away, one seated behind the other. Well, seems like there's always something doing at that small house halfway up in the next block. So be sure to come along when we visit Dick and Sade the next time. This is Ed Hurley speaking. The Raleigh Cigarette Program from Hollywood, starring Red Skelton, with Oz and Nelson and his orchestra, Harriet Hilliard, and yours truly, Truman Bradley. Smokers, any cigarette can claim superiority, but we give you proof. Proof of Raleigh's outstandingly high quality that you can plainly see for yourself. Compare the open ends of a pack of Raleigh cigarettes with any other brand. You'll see instantly that the tobaccos in Raleigh's are unmistakably more golden in color. And that speaks quality in the tobacco business. Any expert will tell you the more golden tobaccos are choicer, more expensive. Yes, smokers, you can make this test yourself. You can prove to yourself that Raleigh's do give you the better tobaccos. And Raleigh's give you valuable coupons, too, redeemable for premiums, war stamps, or cash. Truly, 
Rollies offer you more than any other cigarette. Next time, why not try Rollies? And now we bring you the star of our Rollie cigarette show, Red Skelton. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Well, Red, what's cooking? I don't know, but I'll bet it didn't come in cans. Now, uh, what have you been doing all week? Well, you know, you're now looking at Victory Garden Skelton. Tell me, how much Victory Garden have you got? One acre. It's my back. Well, well, the secret to a successful Victory Garden is not to plant more than you can care for. Things really grow fast out here in California, don't they, Red? Yeah, I'll say you don't even have to plant anything. You just hold the seed in your hand, the ground comes up and snaps at it. <laughs> No kidding, I planted some beans last summer, uh, last week, <laughs> and this morning they're halfway to Boston. <laughs> Red, tell me, how about tomatoes? No, I'm going home early tonight. <laughs> no, no, I, I'm talking about your victory garden. Oh, say, have you got a victory garden, Truman? Yes, sir, indeed I have. Everyone should have a victory garden, really? especially this year, because one-fourth of our total food production in 1943 will be needed for our armed forces. And to help our allies. Oh. Hiya, Red. Hiya, Harriet. Oh, boy, am I tired. I've been working my garden. Yeah? Yeah, Ozzy was helping me. I dug up the garden and raked the soil and dug the holes and planted the seeds. Wait a minute. What did Ozzy do? <laughs> oh, he prayed for rain. <laughs> <laughs> say, not only have I got vegetables, but you should see the fruit I'm getting, too. Yeah, me, too. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> you know, in my yard, I've got lemons, tangerines, and kumquats. What's a kumquat, Red? Well, in California, that's just another name for a Florida orange. <laughs> Hiya, folks. Hello, Ozzy. Harriet was telling me about your Victory Garden. Yeah, it's fun to have your own garden. Yeah. And besides, Victory Gardens reduce the demand of commercial food supplies, and that leaves more for everyone. Now, how's your garden doing? Well, everything was all right until last week when the rains came. The rains came. What happened? Did your garden wash away? Oh, no. But I just opened the back door and waited for the right vegetable to flow past. <laughs> Say, I thought it never rained in California, Red. Well, all I know is I went to the door and a fella handed me a letter from the Chamber of Commerce. And what did it say? It says, Dear Mr. Skelton, regardless of all that stuff you see running down the gutter, it does not rain in California. <laughs> and then what happened? Oh, he got back in his boat and paddled away. <laughs> your own vegetables will help you during this point rationing. Yeah, what do you mean, Harriet? Well, we're still using the stuff we grew last year. I oh. put it up in bottles last summer. You know, I put my stuff next to my uncle's bottled goods in the wine cellar. What happened? Well, did you ever open up a can of cherries and have them throw your arms, their arms around you and say, what you doing, big boy? <laughs> say, have you had any trouble with gophers, Red? No, they're all right if you cook them long enough. <laughs> of the gophers been eating your vegetables. Yeah, I'll say they have, and boy, are they fresh. One gopher grabbed my reddish, and he looked up at me, and he says, well, don't stay in there, stupid. Pass the salt. borrows all my newest shirts and wears my sharpest ties. He even lends my car out to a dozen other guys. If I should try to get a ride, I get the well-known thumb from my old chum. I try to get a night of rest. I even lock the door. But he brings in a party that swings out till three or four. Who winds up sleeping in my bed while I sleep on the floor? My old chum. We make a blind date with a couple of girls to dine at some fancy priced grill. I always wind up with the homely one, and of course, I'm the guy who pays the bill. I thought I'd found the one girl who could never be surpassed. I even got to thinking, this is real romance at last. Then I found she'd run away with just another bum. My old chum. <laughs> wears 
my finest evening gowns, gets runners in my hose, and uses my pet powder puff to dull her shiny nose. My mail is opened by mistake, but she knows who it's from. She's my old chum. She broadcasts all my secrets, but to everyone in town, and splashes in my fine perfume. It really gets me down. She beats me to the kitchen, and she leaves me not a crumb. That's my old chum. She tells me she simply adores my new hat. She says, "My dear, it's too, too divine." Then says to all my friends, "Is she kidding with that?" <laughs> But then, after all, what can you expect for a dollar forty-nine? While glancing through this morning's pictures on the social page, I saw the Duke of、uh, something or other, the newest social rage, and standing right beside the Duke, but standing well upstage, was my old chum. Sung by Harriet Nosey and dedicated to the 364th Infantry. Well, say, Red, outside of playing army camps in the desert and working in your victory garden, what else、uh, did you do last week? Well, I started my spring cleaning. I took down my woolen drapes and I washed them in boiling water. Now, Red, hot water shrinks wool and makes the colors run. Yeah, you know anybody wants to buy a piece of plaid Kleenex? <laughs> Say, aren't you starting your spring cleaning just a little too early? Oh,、no, everybody's cleaning house now. You take Clem, the fellow from the country. He started his, cleaning up his farm last week and had quite a job too. He was. Well, here I am. Two eyes of blue, do 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 do. <laughs> yes, sir. Eyes of blue and nothing between them but a blank expression. <laughs> Boy, do I hate spring cleaning. I wish Daisy June was here. I'd pretend I was sick and then make her do the work for me. <laughs> so don't laugh. I bet some of you guys pull the same trick. <laughs> I bet that's another one of those OPA men working his way through college. <laughs> I'll just take this baseball bat, and if he puts his foot through the door, I'll let him hit. <clears throat> I don't want any. Hello, can you? Will do. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I bought the ticket. Sure. <laughs> Boy, there's nothing I like better than free dancing. Well, Clem, ain't you gonna invite me in? Yeah, I'm kind of busy cleaning my house. You well, know. you ain't doing a very good job. You ain't. Look, I can write my name in the dust on this plow in the hall. <laughs> you can. Gee, education's a wonderful thing, ain't it? <laughs> well, what you look at it? Was you expecting me to help you? Now she ought to know better than that. <laughs> yep. Yeah, yeah, hey, which one of these bottles is floor polish? Well, this、do? one's floor polish, and the other one's hair restorer. Okay. Now, why did you break that good bottle of hair restorer? Well, I don't want to make the same mistake I made last year. I used the hair restorer for floor polish. What happened? Every time I swept the floor, I had to part it in the middle. <laughs> And finish my knit until you get through. What you making? Well, that's a surprise. I'm a making your birthday present. What is it? It's a secret. Oh, what is it? I won't tell me. Clem, you're a sap. Yeah, I'm a jerk too. Now, how can you be a jerk and a sap too? I lead a double life. <laughs> hey, come on, Daisy June. Tell me what you making?、Hmm? Well, I'm knitting you some underwear, Clem. You want to see them? Underwear for me? Let's see them. Okay, there. Gee, zoot snuggies. <laughs> Say, Clem, you know this room would look better if you took that wash tub off and down the mantel. Well, okay, I'll climb up there and get it off and down. Well, throw it down, Clem. Be careful you don't fall. <clears throat> Suppose you let go of it, wasn't it? <laughs> Are you hurt? No, I always wrap my ears around my head like a turban. <laughs> Hey, get a load of the dude that's coming up the house. He sure looks funny, don't he? Look at this—no toes. 
He's a wearing shoes. Shoes? Clam. His toes are inside them things. What's the matter? Is he ashamed of them? <laughs> howdy. Uh, howdy, I'm selling soap. What's this? Well, that's that stuff you wash with. You know, it takes the dirt off. No kidding. Boy, what they won't think of next. Uh, won't you come in? Well, thanks. Well, uh... Mm. You just back from feeding the pigs, ain't you? Yeah, how'd you know? Never mind, I'll just open the window. <laughs> now, this here bath soap smells as sweet as a rose. Uh, would you like to take a bath with some? Take a bath? Are you kidding? This ain't April. <laughs> Clem, stop talking like that. Why don't you go take a bath? Just figure it's part of your spring cleaning. Okay, give me the soap. It won't burn, will it? Oh, brother, not that soap. It's made of coconut oils and vegetables. Well, I'll just sip it. I'll just go in here in the bathroom and try it out. I'll get off these clothes. My hat, my overcoat, my vest, my coat, my vest, my coat. Well, Daisy June, you remember that windbreaker I lost last winter? Yes? I just found it. <laughs> Boy, there's nothing like a good cold shower. Oh, feel like a new man. <laughs> well, Clem, how do you like that soap? Tastes pretty good. Now, wait a minute. You ain't eating that, are you? You said it was made out of vegetables, didn't you? Yeah. Well, I ain't letting no good food go down no drain pipe in times like this, brother. <laughs> Sure, I'm all right. Didn't hurt me. <clears throat> but now I know what they mean when they sing, I'm forever blowing bubbles. Speaking of spring cleaning, did you hear what happened at Dead Eye out in Poison Gulch last week? No. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yes, the program it in, right? <laughs> so what happened? <laughs> here, they were all sitting around in the Red Devil Saloon when someone decided they should clean up the town. Yeah. Hey, piano player, stop that, will you? Stop that. Oh, come on, piano player, stop! <laughs> all right, brother, you asked for it. How do you like that? I had to shoot the piano, too. <laughs> Okay, now let's get back to this card game. Uh, <clears throat> what are you holding there, Clem? Uh, Slim? <laughs> who? Slim, what are you uh, got? Six aces. What have you got? Six aces. Well, what do you know? It's a tie. <laughs> now, wait a minute. What's that card up your sleeve? Up my sleeve? Yeah. Well, lucky for me, another ace. I win. <laughs> Sweetie pie today. Well, monotonous Maggie. How you been, Dad? Swell. I've been home making myself pretty for you. Yeah. Remember them circles I used to have under my eyes? Yeah. Well, look now. Great ball of fire triangle. <laughs> well, ain't you gonna kiss me? No, I'm busy cheating at cards. <clears throat> Besides, I kissed you last night, didn't I? Yeah, but look, my lips are all pulled out straight again now. <laughs> to make love to me like Charles, boy, uh. You want uh, me to make love like Charles, boy, yeah, uh, huh? Okay. Come with me to the Caspar, Mustel. Come with me to the Caspar, come with me. Uh, you thought I should come with you to the Caspar? Yeah. I wish you'd stop crying, gal. You're putting my Raleigh cigarette out. <laughs> of course I love you, Mag. Why, I'm crazy about your little scrub nose. No, dead eye. You mean snub. I got a snub nose. Okay, but if I was you, I'd scrub my snub. <laughs> you know, gal, every time I look at you... Yes? I wish I hadn't. <laughs> every 
time I look at you, goose pimples go up and down my backbone. Goose pimples, huh? Well, grab them. These are meatless days, you know. <laughs> I don't know why you don't like me. I'm just like Hetty Lamar. We're both women, aren't we? Yeah. Beer and champagne both come in bottles, too. <laughs> Get a load of the blimp that just uh, floated in. <laughs> Boy, would Lieutenant Bill like to drop a blockbuster like you. <laughs> well, uh, what you doing, stranger? Howdy, stranger. My name's Beanpole. Beanpole? <laughs> Boy, you're the fattest beanpole I ever saw. Yep, the beans never grew out of me. <laughs> hey, who are you? I'm Deadeye, the toughest cowboy in the West. I stand eight feet two in my stocking feet. How tall are you with shoes on? Who's got shoes nowadays? <laughs> you look kind of run down to me. Listen to the man, will you? Why, you know them big construction companies that build them big roads through the hot desert? Yes. You know them great big boulders have to be broken into little bitty pieces? Yes. You know that tar and asphalt has to be stamped and pounded till it's flat? Yes. I paint the white lines down the middle of the road. <laughs> My, my, who's this little creature I see here? <laughs> she does that every time she wants a lump of sugar. <laughs> I'd like to know you better, little lady. Pull up my knee and sit down. Okay, where is it? <laughs> Say, what brings you to Poison Gulch? Dead Eye, I'm here to clean up this place. Now, wait a minute, that's my job. Oh, Dead Eye, what did you ever do to clean up this town? Well, I've done a lot. You know that dirty old bank with all that filthy money with them germs on it? Yeah. Cleaned it out last night. <laughs> it's about time somebody cleaned out this town. By golly, you're right. We'll get together and throw out every dirty crook and every dirty politician that lives here. Are you with me? Yeah. Here, put me down. Now, listen, there's dirtier crooks in this town besides me. Hey, I got to think fast, Maggie. I wonder what Gene Audrey would do in a spot like this. He'd throw away his guns, roll up his sleeves, and give them the worst licking of their lives. Yeah. I wonder what baby Sandy would do in the same spot. <laughs> Clean-ups. He's out in the backyard washing his face in the, in the basin. This is the way you wash your face, wash your face, wash your face. This is the way. Why, hello there, Nude. What are you washing your face in the backyard for? Well, I have to. You see, my wife's taking a bath standing up. A bath standing up? Why doesn't she sit down? Well, she can't. You see, I've got a fleet of toy battle boats in the tub. <laughs> and yesterday she sat on the submarine. Oh. <laughs> submarine, huh? Yeah. Well, whether it's some soldier, some sailor, or submarine, they all agree on Rawleys. Because smokers know that Endo Rawleys goes everything to make them the very best cigarette you can buy. 
The tobaccos are the very finest quality, and you can prove that for yourself. No! Oh, oh. uh, what's the matter? Don't oh. you believe me? Oh, sure. I got some soap in my eyes. I can't stay. Well, get that soap out of your eyes, Newt, because I want you to see at a glance the tobaccos in Raleigh's are more golden in color. Any expert will tell you these more golden tobaccos are choicer, more expensive. Yes, you get better tobaccos in Raleigh's. And you get a better blend of tobaccos, too. Well, I got some all ready to dry off. Now, hand me the towel, will you? Sure, here you are. Oh, boy, does that feel good. Pardon me while I do it behind my ears. Go you? right ahead, because ear's good news for you. Raleigh's exclusive blend gives you a richer taste and flavor. A smooth, mellow mildness that no other cigarette can quite match. And no other cigarette can match Raleigh's for extra value. Boy, either. am I clean. Nobody will ever recognize me if I keep on. Oh, yes. Raleigh's give you valuable premium coupons. Remember, <laughs> redeemable as well for war stamps and cash. Now, to get the most from the cigarettes you smoke, always ask for Raleigh's. Raleigh cigarettes. <laughs> Then we have a lady and her little boy. Cleaning house is really something for her, especially with Junior helping. So, Harriet, you be my mother, and I'll be the mean little kid. Junior, listen, Mother's busy cleaning the attic, and I want you to be good today. Promise me, will you? I've been good. This morning I could have bitten that little boy next door, but I used me willpower, and I didn't do it. That's wonderful, Junior. Yeah, but if he ever puts down that baseball bat, look out. (laughs) Time is it out there by the clock? Junior? I will go see. I will see what time it is. Well, Junior? Well, the widow hand is on four and the big hand is on the widow hand. Well, that ought to be easy. What time do you think it is? Time I stop putting glue on the widow hand. <laughs> oh, look at me basketball. I think I will play some ping pong. Ping pong with a basketball? Sure, what? Ping <laughs> <Gee>, ping pong. <laughs> Young man, you can pay for that window out of your allowance each week. Well, now, that's mighty neighborly of you. <laughs> Look at this place. Now, I ought to paddle you a good one. Oh, don't do that, Mummy, because after all, you're the pretty Mummy. You're so nice and so young, and you get prettier every day, you do. Well, that's a nice compliment, Junior. Yeah. All right, run along. Boy, that P.T. Barnum sure knew what he was talking about. Didn't <laughs> <you>? <laughs> oh, somebody at the door, we had got company. Every day we got company. Is that you, Pop? No, I'm the junk man. Oh. Have you got any old newspapers or magazines or rags or old iron or maybe old bottles? Well, do you have any old bags? Only under me widow eye. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Junk Man. Junior, you go into the next room. No, you let me stay or I will hit myself on the head with this book. Junior, stop hitting yourself with that book. Do you want to lose my place? Oh. <laughs> now get into the other room. Now go you on. let me stay or I will tell. You'll tell what? You'll help me, I will blab everything. <laughs> What? I will tell everybody used to be an Indian princess with a medicine show. Oh, Junior, that's not true. Oh, no. Hey, Pocahontas, here comes the crowd. Quick, Doc, hand me me cure comb and me fetish. Junior! <laughs> that does it. Oh, oh, you hit me. You hit me. You not told me baby deep out. You not told me baby deep out. Junior, you don't have any baby teeth anymore. I know. You knock them all out. <laughs> Lady, I'm still here. Do you have any junk? Oh, why, yes. You really came just in time. I'm cleaning out the attic. Well, that's fine. I'll come right up and I'll help you bring your stuff down. Oh, that's a good idea. I'll lead the way. It's rather dark up there. Oh, I don't mind. (laughs) You see what happens, fellas, while you was working? (laughs) Junior, you're fishing for a whipping. Something tells me I was using the right bait, too, boy. (laughs) Oh, there he oh, that is. that cat. Junior, put the cat outside. Okay, Where come you? on, cat, come on. Here, don't you scratch me. Come here. I'll rub your fur the wrong way for that, boy. Whoa! Whoa! How do you like that? He can spit right through his hide. <laughs> Careful, cat. You get off that table before you knock that little lamp over. Come on. Oh. Junior, that what did cat, you break? That cat, he... Oh, no, you don't. I'm getting tired of you breaking things and blaming it on the cat. <laughs> now you're going to get it. Oh, oh, oh! Back to nature, me back. Well, I guess I cried wolf once too often. <laughs> cat, you is cook. Come in, sit down, will you? I want to have a man to man talk to you. A man to cat talk, rather. <laughs> we is true. You've outlived your usefulness with me. I used to depend on you, but 
And I don't know, you'll just, you just you ain't no good no more. I'm sorry. I'll keep you on the feeding list, but from now on, you got to catch your own mice. <laughs> oh, there's the phone. Oh, I'll get boy, it. Now's me chance to get to that junk man up in the attic. Oh, boy. Hey, look at all this stuff in this trunk over here. Yeah, I wonder what it is. No, that's me mummy's wedding outfit. Oh, sure enough. Yeah. Dried flowers, uh, bridal veil, handcuffs, bear trap, and shotgun. <laughs> Wait a minute. I wonder what that's doing in there. I don't know. I asked me mummy once, and she just closed her trunk and says, Oh, wouldn't you like to know? <laughs> hey, wait a minute. Here's something I really want. Oh, no, I'm sorry. We couldn't sell that. Oh, I'll give you a nickel for it. No, I... Sure, sure. Oh, boy, am I lucky. Why, you can't get stuff like this anymore. Well, so long, little fellow. Goodbye, goodbye. Hurry, hurry. Hurry, hurry. hurry. What happened to the junk man, Junior? He gave me a nickel and went away. What did you sell him? Just a case of that old canned goods. Congratulations to the generous Americans who have made it possible for our boys far away from the comforts of home in Africa and Guadalcanal to have a large quantity of our cigarettes, which bear the union label, donated to them free by the Carpenters District Council of Washington, D.C. Also congratulations to the Teamsters Local Number 99 of Miles City, Montana, for their generous gift of our cigarettes to the sailors patrolling the seas. And remember, we'll all be back again next Tuesday at the same time. Red Skelton, Ozzie Nelson and his orchestra, Harriet Hilliard, and yours truly, Truman Bradley. Meanwhile, listen to the Tommy Dorsey Show tomorrow night over most of these same stations. Until next Tuesday, then. This is Red Skelton saying goodbye now and thanks for listening and help the war effort plant a victory garden. Red Skelton is heard on this program through the courtesy of the Metro Golden Mayor Studios. This program has been broadcast to the Armed Forces Overseas. Coming in from a high speed trial run, a new Navy boat edges gracefully up to a mooring. Great work, Skipper. How'd she handle? Well, I jumped out. <clears throat> Say, you really planned the ship there, mister. Handled beautifully. Made the trip so fast, I'm still rocking a bit. Well, then, hey. try my simmer down prescription, a pipe load of Sir Walter Raleigh. Why, thanks. I smoke Raleigh myself. Sort of my first mate, you might say. I find it's just the thing to help me relax. Sure does. When I'm working over the drawing board, a couple of puffs of Raleigh just seem to sort of take the pressure off. Guess a lot of fellas feel the same way. Right you are, Skipper. Men everywhere who are doing things are Sir Walter Raleigh smokers. They enjoy that smooth, mellow, nut-like flavor. Raleigh's bite-free richness. So take this tip, all you pipe smokers. Tonight, try Raleigh, the quality pipe tobacco of America. Sir Walter Raleigh. This program has come to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. entertainers in America as requested by you, the fighting men of the United States Armed Forces throughout the world. Command Performance presented this week and every week till it's over, over there. <laughs> Communique from Command Performance. Our forces on the American entertainment front are maintaining contact with Uncle Sam's armed forces on the fighting front. We're pushing back the curtains on another great command performance in answer to your thousands of letters. There's much to report from this area tonight, and the man to report it, a great actor and a great guy, 
called back to your big show by popular acclaim of the AEF, your master of ceremonies, Terry Grant. Thank you, Don Wilson. And hello again, fellas. One of these days, command performance is going to call in the ski troopers because we've got a pile of letters from you guys that make Mount Rainier look like a molehill. And that's exactly the way we like it because the number one job of the American entertainment industry is to give you number one Americans the entertainment you want. And brother, it starts coming at you right now. To the Green Banana Boys in Africa, to Dick Sayers at APO 832, to Stager and Walters and the gang at APO 516, and to you base workers in Bermuda, here's that sensational novelty band playing Hotcha Cornia, Spike Jones and the City Slickers. City Slickers. Well, fellas, we'd like to throw a dozen fancy orchids to a bunch of you guys somewhere in the British Isles. You're known as the TAF, and one of you has a friend in Cambridge, Mass. The orchids are for the tough job you did for the AAF. And command performance sweetens those orchids with a girl hundreds of you asked for. A girl most of you know is a screwball and a clown. Yet a girl who has one of the most remarkable coloratura voices in the country. And when I say country... I am speaking from an agricultural point of view. That old corny favorite, Jim, by Miss Joan Davis. Jim doesn't ever send me pretty flowers. Jim never tries to cheer my lonely hours. I don't know why I'm so crazy for Jim. Oh, Jim. See, I'll never forget the night I met Jim. I was about to end it all. But just as I was ready to jump off the bridge, along came Jim. He didn't let me jump. 
He pushed me. <laughs> oh, Jim. Jim wasn't like other fellas. He didn't want to hug and kiss all the time. Why, well, he was happy just to sit home with me and go... <laughs> Life. Life was one gay round of pleasure for Jim and me. Me and Jim then... Then came our first quarrel. He hit me over the head with my mother. <laughs> oh, I... I didn't mind, but mother stabbed him with a barracuda. <laughs> All those long hours that I nursed him back to health. I didn't eat. I didn't sleep. All I could think of morning, noon, and night was Jim, Jim, Jim. I mean Jim, Jim, Jim. <laughs> I, I know Jim isn't true. He beats me and mistreats me. But what can I do? I've tried and tried to leave Jim, but I can't. He keeps me chained to the front porch. <laughs> oh, but someday I know that he will up and leave me. But even if he does, you can believe me. I'll go on tearing the cord, eating out my heart, waiting for his call. I just can't live without my... Uh, what's that fellow's name again? Jim. Oh, yeah. My Jim. <laughs> Thank you, Joan Davis. Well, fellas, we're putting this next number on a special beam aimed at Rip, Brick, and Chud at France Field. And we're cutting over to American Samoa to call on Levis, Kofelt, and the Navy medics at Tutuia. And we're answering that letter from three jungle mothers who say they're out of the mud and walking on air since they saw Miss Reza Stevens in The Chocolate Soldier. So to all you hundreds of guys who are partial to our great operatic star... Here she is, singing my hero, lovely Reza Stevens. I have a true and noble lover. He is my sweetheart, oh, my own. He is like on earth who shall his heart is mine and mine oh, We've let the heart be to the other And for our happiness I pray Our lives belong to one and all Happy way 
a few weeks ago, a lady did the St. Louis Blues on command performance. And what happened? She sang, you listened. And then hundreds of you sat down and wrote, make it another engagement soon. So tonight, it's another command performance for America's beloved blues singer, Ethel Waters. Thank you, Terry Grant, and love and God's blessings to all you boys over there. Thank you so much for inviting me back. And this time, how about listening to A Woman Without a Man? Quite appropriate. You look around nature, and what do you see? A bird with a bird, and a bee with a bee. When you listen to nature, who do you hear moan? That miserable misfit who travels alone. This sermon has a moral. The moral, it ain't new. The Lord wants everything to buy to. And a woman without a man like an architect without a plan is like a face in face in street without a pen a woman without a man a lady without a gem is like the first of may without the rim is like a resident without a resident, a lady without a gem. Like a brush without a bristle, like a toe without a nipple, nothing else but. And honey, can your heart surrender to a thing that wears suspenders? You. tonight the world's greatest master of the good old harmonica. In other words, the lip lute or musical spare rib. By command of the Army and Navy in the Hawaiian Islands, 
and Uncle Sam's armed forces everywhere, the Bolero and Larry Adler. Larry Adler. Every once in a while, fellas, your letters asking for two famous comedians cause a young hurricane around command performance. So hold on to your G.I. hats, for here they come. Abbott and Costello! Look, suppose you walk into a restaurant, and the waiter places over here a platter of beans, over here a great big juicy steak. Now, which one of these two would you eat? I ate the steak. You would. I like Do you it. know where that steak comes from? A cow. A cow. And you, just to satisfy your selfish appetite... You let them go out and kill a poor, innocent little cow. Now I'm killing cows. Uh, 
You know what that cow gives? No. That cow gives milk. No, she don't. You gotta take it away from her. Nah, never mind the remark. That cow gives milk. Who does that milk supply? Little babies. Little innocent cuts. Without that milk, they'd perish, die. But you don't care. Just so that you can have your steak, you let them go out, kill all the cows, and let the little babies of the world starve to death. I'm a love. No. I've killed babies, cows, putting people out of work. You realize what you're doing? I'm wrecking the country just because I won't eat mustard. Now, I'll blame it on mustard. You still haven't answered one question. Why don't you ask me something with a little sense to it? Will you answer it? Go ahead and take a crack at it. All right. Make it easy. All right. Say you walk into a railroad depot, any depot. Say the Grand Central Depot in New York City. Now, you walk into that depot and you buy a ticket. Where are you going? I'm not going anywhere. All right, I well, what are you buying a ticket for? I'm not buying any ticket. What are you doing in the depot? <laughs> Ask me that again, slow. Now, don't get excited. I asked you to ask me something easy, well, didn't I? Well, simple enough. Now, ask me something easy. You're in the Grand Central Depot. What are you doing there? I don't know. Well, what does anyone go to a depot for? Two or three things. We don't... Look, uh, I'm only asking you, what are you doing in that depot? I'll go away. That's the boy. Now, there's no harm in that, is there? No, no. Now, where are you going? I'm going away. Where? Why don't you let it go at that? I'm going away and that's that. But, I mean, you know where you're going. I know where I'm going. I just don't go on the railroad station without knowing where I'm going. I didn't see I you. know where I'm going. Well, tell the folks out here where you're going. I am going away. Where? <laughs> where? I'm going away. But where? Where are you going? You know where you're going, don't you? Yeah, I know where I'm going. I mean, there's no secret connected with oh, it. Oh, no, I'm... You're not ashamed of where you're going, are you? What I got to be ashamed of? Well, where are you going? I am going away. Where? I'll go to Baltimore. I don't want to go, but I'll go. Baltimore. What's the matter with Philadelphia? What have you got against I got Philadelphia? nothing against Philadelphia. Then why did you have to pick out Baltimore? I got Bal friends in Baltimore. Suppose you had friends in Philadelphia. All right, then I go to Philadelphia. And what happened to your friends in Baltimore? I'm not talking to them anymore. Look, suppose your wife was in Philadelphia. Then I go to Chicago. Ah, oh, what you... Abbott and Costello. Well, fellas, one of the command performance gals who keeps frequent dates with hundreds of you is Ginny Sims. And Ginny is here tonight especially for the engineers at APO 860 and for Susina at APO 960. And hey, Susina, I hope next July the 28th you have a big party for you in Passaic, New Jersey. And Ginny's warbling tonight also for the Marines at Cristobal, for Callaway and Everett, and for Russell over there in India. Hey, you guys in Barracks 20 at APO 251, are you on the beam? And the same to Powers of APO 953. And to Profit and your buddies at APO 954. With a big hello from the state of Ohio. To Dean and Kane at Kanoki Bay. To Dallas and the gang in Barracks 32 at Honolulu. And to all of you, here's Embraceable You and Embraceable Ginny Sims.
got a feeling I've fallen in love with you. The Nazi pilot said when the Flying Fortress let him have it, a few more seconds and it'll all be over. Yes, sir, another command performance is almost over. But just like those Flying Fortresses, there'll be many more to come. Thanks a lot for the great letters you write to command performance and for giving the American entertainment industry this privilege of serving you. This is Cary Grant, speaking for the United States of America, where we never say hi to anyone and where the one big job today is beating hi out of the axis. So long, fellas. Command Performance USA. The American entertainment industry salutes to you fighting men of Uncle Sam's armed forces and your friends throughout the world. Thanks again for those letters. Keep them rolling into the station to which you are listening. And the answers will come rolling back to you each week and every week till it's over, over there. This is Don Wilson saying good night from Uncle Sam. Hello there. We've been waiting for you. It's time to play Truth or Consequences. Brought to you by Velvet Sun's Ivory Soap, 99 and 44, 100% pure. It floats. Hold your hats, folks. He's in again. The land have brought the front parlor back into its own. Your truth for consequences, man, Ralph Edwards. <laughs> oh, Eddie, that's great. And Harley, he can even party players. Uh... Uh, who was missing? The contestants that we chose in the audience beforehand, we called up a lot of them. Did they all come up? All right. Uh, we choose them just before we go on the air, and we want to make sure they all were up here. Uh, Ed Hurley, he? Nice hey. to have, on the, on the, have you on the show, boy. Listen, Thank here's something you folks uh, will be interested to hear. You folks listening in out there on the West Coast, and wrong from uh, Denver West. Remember, a few weeks back, we had a uh, mother of a son who was in the service uh, talk for a few moments on the sale of war bonds, and then we said if she sold $10,000 worth over our 22 Western stations before the program went off the air, we'd give her a free uh, visit, free trip to visit her son at his camp. Well, we sold $109,000 in bonds, just on the hookup that with you folks here that are listening. And tonight, we did the same show, giving another mother a chance to see her, uh, to see her son, if she sold $50,000 in war bonds, on Truth or Consequences, on our Eastern show. We put the goal at 50000 because there are five times as many stations on the Eastern hookup. And she sold, within 25 minutes, over half a million dollars in war bonds. <laughs> On our first show. And, uh, the reports are still coming in. They estimate a million dollars will be sold 
uh, just from that one mother making a 30-second plea for war bonds. Our thanks to you folks and the NBC stations for such wonderful cooperation. Incidentally, Butte, Montana deserves special mention, don't they? KGIR uh, reported over $50,000 alone on our Western show a few weeks ago. More bombs and bullets to sink the axis, hey, boys? Here we have three men at the microphone. Hello, fellas. Hi. Hi. Hi, you. Hi, you. I wonder if I got all your names here. Who's Mr. Fleming? Robert Fleming. Right here. How are you, sir? Fine, thank you. Where are you from? New York. What's your occupation? Patrolman. A patrolman? That's right. He's got us. <laughs> Joints rated. Get out. Get out. Go on back. It's all right. Just let me wear this tuxedo through the show. That's all. <laughs> Mr. Al Zudek. Zudek, how are you? Right here. Fine, thank you. Where are you God. from? Los Angeles. Los Angeles? And what is your occupation? Salesman. Salesman. It carries you far afield, does it not, eh? You betcha. All right, Mr. John Martin. Right. Hello there, Mr. Martin. Oh, You're yeah. from Weehawken, New Jersey. That's right. What do you uh, do? Printer in a film lab. Okay, now, boys, we're going to have a little question for you, Miss it? We'll have a little consequence, eh? Uh, it's another in our series of bigger questions, biggies, we call them. See if you can figure this bigger. Mama Bigger and Papa Bigger and Baby Bigger were out on a picnic eating hot dogs. Along came a bee and stung Baby Bigger. Who was the bigger, bigger, and why? Truth or consequences? 20 seconds. Baby Bigger. Baby Bigger, why? You have to you got say. me there. <laughs> no, it got baby bigger there. Uh, the bee. Uh, well, as I said, Mama Bigger and Papa Bigger and Baby Bigger were out on the picnic eating hot dogs. Along came a bee and stung Baby Bigger. Who was the bigger, bigger, and why? The answer is Baby Bigger because he was a weenie bit bigger. Oh. Just a little And there we go. In the file and forget department, you haven't told the truth, Mr. Martin, Mr. Zudek, and Mr. Fleming, so you must pay the consequences. Putting towels around the neck now. Please uh, take off your coats. Roll up your sleeves, boys. Roll them up there. Way up the sleeves. Take off your coats. And then we'll put shower caps on you, too. We want to be well protected in this consequence. And um, put you behind these three screens that we have on stage. There go the shower caps. That's to keep any flying hair out of your eyes, gentlemen. We'll put you behind those uh, three screens there on stage that face each other in a triangular formation. Uh, each screen faces the other, you understand? And each one has a hole for your head and... Uh, two holes for your arms. Now, uh, Mr. Fleming, you get behind screen number one. Mr. Martin, you behind screen number two, and you stick your head and arms out of uh, screen number three there. Mr. Zuder. Zudek it is. All right. Uh, Martin in one, uh, Fleming in two, Zudek in three. Remember those numbers? Remember those names. Now, listen. Each one of you will now be handled a bottle of, uh, handed a bottle of seltzer water. There you are. A bottle of seltzer water. Don't squirt them. Don't squirt them yet, fellas. You won't, you won't squirt it yet, will you, Mr. Zudek? Oh, gosh. No, 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 no. All right, I'm going to ask some uh, questions of different people in our audience. And uh, their answer must be a number, such as uh, how many children do you have? And if the person should say three, why, number one, that is Mr. Fleming. Uh, uh, and Mr. Uh, Martin, number two, would squirt water. And Mr. Zudek, number three. And then if I should ask... Uh, a question that should provoke an answer that was number two will say number one and number three will shoot at Mr. Martin. You see how that is? Whenever the number is called, the other two fellows squirt water at the number called. All right. All right, we go into the audience now to uh, get the answers that will determine your fate. Now, just one thing to remember, boys. Listen, just one thing to remember. Every time you get hit with water, yell, I love it! I love it! <laughs> will you yell that once just for fun? Let's hear it. I love it. I love it. Yeah, I'm sure you do. All right. Now, let's see. I'll, uh, I'll uh, ask this lady a uh, uh, question first. How many shower caps do you see on stage? Three. 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 Two and one, hit it! <laughs> All right, whoa, that's good. Mr. Zudek really got it. So did the contestants. Mr. Fleming, Mr. Fleming, be careful of your aim. You went clear over the top of the screen and landed on half the contestants. Uh, into the audience. Everybody goes into the audience. All right, let's go. Uh, let's, uh, let's talk with uh, a man now. Let's say uh, this man in here. Uh, do you have any children, sir? You don't. Well, we can't have a number zero. <laughs> do you have any children, sir? Yes, sir. I have one. One? <laughs> Two and three square to number one. <laughs> Did they say I love it? I love it? I didn't hear him saying I love it. I All love right, it. Now, uh, <laughs> now we'll take uh, a lady here, any lady. Let's take this lady. Uh... Uh, which, one, which man up there getting squirted with water do you feel most sorry for? Which one do you feel most sorry for? One, two, or three? 
Mr. Two, you feel sorry for him. This young man who's been in the audience here. Hello, little boy. Hello. How old are you? Four. Four, right? Eh? That won't do us any good. I'm glad I'm in the audience that it got me. Can you uh, can you count? Yes. Let Let's hear you count. One. <laughs> Keep going. Don't stop there. Two. Yes. Everybody except you folks at home there got wet on that one. Wow. Five dollars a piece to each of the men and uh, five cakes of ivory soap to you all. And uh, to the four-year-old boy in the audience, thanks. thanks. <laughs> oh, Laura. Laura Hello, Dean Dutton. Dutton. Hello, folks. Hello. Here comes that star of that new Broadway musical, New Faces of 1943. Say, 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 it's Laura Dean Dutton, and it's time for beauty, Laura. Well, then it's time for ivory. Well, what's your song? Kalamazoo. Laura, you're on. I-V-O-R-Y-S-O-O-O. What a soul. It's grand for your skin. From coast to coast, gentle ivory's the toast of ladies who win in love and romance. Baby will say, it's ivory for you. For your complexion, it's simply perfection. You'll say so, too. It's true of ivory. Doctors say to use it. Doctors say to choose it. Doctors should know. Ed Hurley? More doctors advise pure ivory soap for your complexion than all other brands of soap put together. It's not accidental. Ivory soap is gentle. Take a look at baby. Then you'll see why I-V-O-R-Y-S-O-A-P is the soap for a lovelier you, Ed. Why, one single cleansing with Velvet Suds Ivory leaves the skin with all its natural beauty, smooth and baby bright. Ivory can do it, so won't you turn to it? Babies do, so why don't you? Oh, 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 what a soap for beauty. <laughs> and that's the truth, Laura Dean Dutton. You betcha. Miss Jean Steenhoff. S-T-E-E-N-H-O-F-F. -F. Hello, Miss Steenhoff. How do you do? Where are you from? New Haven, Connecticut. New Haven, Connecticut. All right. And uh, uh, your occupation? Telephone operator. A telephone operator. All right. Now, I've got a little question here for you. Uh, incidentally, when interviewing you volunteer contestants in the audience, you said you had a soldier boyfriend uh, in Los Angeles. So where, where was he stationed? Lemoore Army Flying School. Lemoore, uh, making sarongs out there, I guess. <laughs> no, they're really working hard and working right, believe me. All right, he's in Los Angeles then. Yes. Uh, do you want to give his name or not? He sure, and Corporal Thomas Arden. Okay. Here's your question. Oh, Corporal, what's going to happen if she misses this? Let's see how well acquainted you are with the ups and downs of things. Uh, what manner of transportation carries more passengers per day in the United States than any other? Truth or consequences? Go Beulah. No snitching in the audience. <laughs> Please. What manner of transportation carries more passengers per day in the United States than any other? I don't know. You have me. <laughs> Now, the corporal's got you. I just know the question. Elevators. Oh. oh. Well, you haven't told the truth. Corny. So, that's what? Corny. Corny? Oh, that's praise for, for a question on this show. Uh, Christmas is upon us. We know that, don't we, Miss Dean? Yes, sir. And our fighting forces will soon be enjoying the 101 welcome presents the folks at home have sent them. Now, truth or consequences, the thought that your boyfriend... Tom out there in Los Angeles might get a kick out of a Christmas stocking filled with presents. Think he would? Yes, sir. All right. So uh, we brought up several gifts and are giving them to you to send on to your boyfriend, 
at, uh, say the camp again or whatever it is. Lemur. Yes. Uh, what's his, uh, Thomas, his name. Yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> uh, we, uh, <laughs> we have a number of beautiful presents for your soldier boy, <laughs> specially selected, and we have a stocking to put all these gifts in. So if you boys will just give me the stocking now, we'll... The stocking. Where's the stocking? We've got to have a stocking. So I'll have to take that off. Well, no, we got. I tell you what we'll do. We'll have to have. We'll ask for volunteers. Uh, first of all, let's ask you, Miss Steenhoff. Are you game enough to donate your stocking to put all your boyfriend's Christmas presents in? My last pair of nylons, but I will. Oh well, <laughs> you will. Sure. Oh, maybe we got an extra pair around here. Sometime we can find one. That's swell. Nylons. Right? All right, and. Uh, <laughs> You You're making it very it. easy for us, yes. I tell you what, we'll wrap them all with Christmas cotton so the uh, stocking won't be marred, and Tom will have to see to it that the stocking gets back to you. <laughs> Don't worry, we've got some other stuff to fix up, so all right. Uh, now, uh, you w say you'll donate the stocking. Thank That's you. well. We realize what a sacrifice giving up a stocking is. Uh, all right, will you bring out a couple of sheets or something, boys, so Miss Steenhoff can have some privacy? Those three <laughs> sheets. All right, there we go. That's it. Now, will some of you gentlemen come up and hold these sheets around Miss uh, Steenhoff to make a sort of tent, please? Just hold them all around her. That's it. We'll have a little bit of music while you're taking off the stocking. Bill Meter at the organ. Will you play a little appropriate music like Take It Off, Take It Off, Billy? There we are. How you doing, Miss Steenhoff? That's it. That's good. Do you need some light? You need some light? Nope. <laughs> Well, that's a powerful lot of, of uh, unsnapping going on there. All right, here we are. Thank you, thank you, Miss Steenhoff. Now, on Christmas morning, this stocking of yours will be given to your boyfriend at, uh, at Lamour Camp there. And you sure it's Lamour? I mean, it's all right to say that, isn't it? And it will be filled with these presents. Hold the microphone. You hold the stocking open, Herb. Kay, you drop the presents in. Ed, you get in here, too. Here we are. First of all, it'll be filled with this Ronson cigarette lighter. There it goes in. Uh, this ever-ready flashlight. There it goes in. This carton of cigarettes into the stocking. A year's subscription... Push it way down, way down. A year's subscription to Newsweek magazine. There it goes. A Schick Injector Razor. A Seaforth Commando Shaving Kit. It's getting... No more room in that stocking? We'll have to have another one, I guess. Bring out the sheet again. Bring out the sheet. A little appropriate music down at the organ, if you will, please. We'll have to have the other stocking. Wait a minute. That's it. But there we go. We need so many presents. Mike, I'm glad we didn't find anyone with short socks. Aren't you, Herb? I'm delighted. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Just one? There we are. All right. How is it? All right? Oh, fine. All right, now, here we go. We'll continue. A whole box of Fifth Avenue candy bars. You can pass, Tom can pass these out. Just dump them in there to all the, the gang and his uh, group there. All right, get all the candy bars in. And now, here is a Bull of Us serviceman's wristwatch to go in the Christmas stocking, too. Show them the nice wristwatch that we have uh, out of the box. All right, and a handsome portable radio. There we are. That goes in there, too. In the stocking. Carefully. Oh, yes! Wait a minute. When I, I forgot a five-gallon keg of witch hazel. Good for tired feet. There it is. Well, wait, that's going to be pretty hard to get in. We'll have to send that out by Pony Express. Boy, is that stocking bulging. Well, Miss Dean Hoff, <laughs> this Christmas stocking will be hung on your boyfriend's army cot in uh, Camp Lamour without a sarong. And uh, he can return it to you after he takes all the goodies out if he wants. Do you think he'll enjoy it? Oh, he will, surely. <laughs> cakes of ivory soap, the suds as soft as baby skin. Wonderful for the complexion. And what's this? Oh, a Christmas present to you, Miss Teenhoff. Will you open it, please? There are three pair of lovely hose, the kind you're wearing. Uh, if they don't fit, let us know, and we'll get the kind that do fit. Thank you. Well, I guess my wife goes without that Christmas present this year. Uh -huh. Those are <laughs> It was fun. It was worth it. All right. Let's have Mr. David Bloom. Hello, Mr. Bloom. How do you do? Where are you from? New York. New York, eh? Uh... Uh, what is your occupation? Manufacturer. Uh, talk very loud. Manufacturer of ladies' hats. Of ladies' hats? That's right. All right. Not ladies' socks. No, nope, I, nope. I know a girl, Miss Steenhoff, we might happen to see. 
All right, you were uh, one of the volunteer contestants in the audience who told us you had a uh, female relative you could call on the telephone in case you missed a question and had to pay the consequences. Is that right? That's right. Okay, here's the question. We'll soon find out if you have to make the call. It comes from uh, Mrs. J.J. Uh, Saresik of Labo, Lebo, Kansas. She asks, what grows only in the wintertime and grows down instead of up? Truth or consequences? And please, no snitching in the audience. You have 20 seconds before a bugle of the buzzer says, it's all up, Mr. Bloom. What grows only in the wintertime? And grows down instead of up. Times are coming up. An eye yeah. signal. <laughs> well, Mr. Bloom, you haven't told the truth, so you must pay the consequences. And your consequence is just to call any female relative you want. Now, I'll tell you what, Mr. Bloom, your telephone awaits you off stage. Just go off there. Give the number of the relative that you want to call. And when you get her on the phone, we'll bring you back on stage. What relative is it, by the way? A sister in law. And where's the sister in law? In Hollywood. In Hollywood? That's right. All right. Uh, off you go. Go on. Get the, give the number to our operator. We'll go on with the show. Just, uh, you'll find him right out at the desk there. The uh, uh, operator will put the call right through, and uh, we'll have some fun. Close the door, because what's going to happen to him? There it closes. He's out of hearing distance. So, now, will uh, Mr. Bloom's wife, Mrs. Bloom, come up on stage quickly, Mrs. Bloom? Come on. We notice Mrs. Bloom uh, here while choosing contestants, too. Come on up, Mrs. Bloom. And uh, quickly, got to get going. There we go. Now, uh, we want you uh, to come right up here at the microphone. I won't, I won't talk to you till you get right up here. Have you, uh, tell me this, besides interviewing the audience tonight, have you ever talked to me before? No, sir. Have you any idea what we want you to do? No, sir. All right. Are you quite familiar with the relative your husband is supposed to be calling on the phone? I am. What's her name? Helen Schrank. Helen. Helen uh, what? Schrank. Well, it should be all right. I, uh, <laughs> I say supposed to be calling because actually our operator is just pretending to be getting the number of the relative. Now, your husband, in other words, is to be the victim of a hoax. The person your husband will talk to on the phone is you, but your voice will be on a recording. Mrs. Schrank won't even have to come into it. Now, here's how we'll work it. I, I'm going to ask you to say a few sentences into this recording machine that we uh, have here. Recording microphone. We'll record what you say. Then this recording... Do I have to make it on, on this mic? I have to make it on this mic, don't I? Oh, any mic. All right. Then this recording will be played back into the receiver of the telephone when your hubby comes back to speak. Do you see? He'll think he's speaking to Mrs. Schrank, his sister-in-law. Can I change that name? What's her first name? Helen. To Helen. But actually, it'll be your... Your familiar voice all the time. Only you'll be standing right beside him. We'll call you. I'm afraid he'll recognize me. Well, that's the consequence. <laughs> we'll we'll see if he does. First, he'll probably say hello. So you watch me very carefully and don't say anything except what I tell you to. You see, because it's going to be recorded. Now you uh, so you say hello into the microphone so we can record it. When I signal you with my hand like this, you say hello. Uh, honey, hello. You had lip. It's all right. That's good. That honey's gonna kill him, believe me. Then, then, then he'll probably say, uh, this is, what's his first name? Dave. He'll say, this is Dave. Uh, so we leave a space on the record, and you say, why, Dave, why darling? Dave, wait a darling? minute, Dave. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Why, Dave, darling, how are you? Don't say that until, that's all right, you can remember that. Why, Dave, darling, how are you? When I go like that, you say, why, Dave, darling, how are you? Why, Dave, darling, how are you? Wonderful the way she does it. All right, that's recorded. Then he'll probably say, he'll say, I'm on truth or consequences. So your next recorded sentence should be, I always said you were the foolish member of the family, Dave. Do you know that? We have it written out here for you. I always said you were the foolish member of the family, Dave. I always said you were the foolish member of the family, Dave. All right, we're getting that. We're going to have to hurry. Now, another pause on the record while he has time to say something else. And then, uh, no matter what he said, we, we'll hear your recorded voice, voice saying, uh, what's your first name? Beatrice. Say, uh, how's Beatrice? That's all you have to say. How now, wait a minute. How's Beatrice? All right. Now, you, say, uh, you better say that again. Say, uh, I can't hear you. How's Beatrice? I can't. Wait, now, wait. I can't hear you. How's Beatrice? Say it once more. How's I... Beatrice? Wait a minute. Is it deaf? How's Beatrice? I can't hear you. How's Beatrice? Are you deaf? <laughs> oh, you're going to kill him. All right. Now, uh, we better skip right to the end of this. All right, listen. Now, now, now we want you to record this. We want, uh, we want you to say, we're sending you two rolls of bologna for Christmas. Now, you can say, we, we're sending you two rolls of bologna for Christmas. We're sending you two rolls of bologna for Christmas. Tie it up. 
All right. That's all right. That was off, wasn't it? All right. Now, don't say any more than what's written on this card now. Say, uh, now we want you to say, as a matter of fact, this is all a lot of baloney because this is your wife speaking. My voice is recorded. It's re can you read it there? Yes, sir. All right, get ready. As a matter of fact, this is all a lot of baloney because this is your wife speaking. My voice is recorded. All right, that's good. That's fine. Now, you go back and sit in the audience. Uh, sit right up there somewhere and get ready to come right back. Uh, we'll call you up in a minute. Uh, Mr. Now, don't, don't let him... He, ha he hasn't seen, has he? That's good. That's good. Now, Mr. Uh, Bloom can be brought back on stage. Come in, Mr. Bloom. You think he's talking to his relative wife. Come on. Actually, it'll be his wife. He'll think it's a relative. Come here, Mr. Bloom. How are you? Fine. How are you? Get on this side of the microphone, will you? Sure. Okay. <laughs> uh, I think the operator... The operator has... Uh, has uh, this uh, relative of yours on the phone, they told me. And we're all, you're all set to talk, are you? I sure am. All right, I think it'd be nice. Come over with this telephone. Uh, Johnny, tune in this mic, will you? Uh, put on, let me put the, on these earphones, and I'll listen in with you. And uh, you take this telephone just a minute now. I think it'd be nice if, if your wife came up and stood beside you so she can say hello to huh? Break, come up, Mrs. Bloom, quickly, Mrs. Bloom. Will you come up, please? I know she's here, because uh, when we interviewed her in the audience tonight, she... Can you get him all right? Hello. Are you on the phone? Come on, Mrs. Bloom, you may want to talk. Is it your sister on the... Is it your sister? Yes. It's your sister. And it's your sister-in-law. Now, what's her name? Helen... St uh, David Frank. Bloom. No, her name, name is Helen Sprank. All right. All right, now, now get ready. Hello. All right, just a moment. Get, now, first of all, say hello to her. Get on the mic. Get on the telephone. Hello. Hello. She, How are you, dear? She said, honey, hello. <laughs> How are you, honey? Say, this is... <laughs> What'd she say? What did she say? How are you? Oh! <laughs> Well, uh, uh, tell her you're on truth or consequences. I'm on truth and consequences now. We're having a swell time. Hello. Hello. I always said you were the foolish member of the family. <laughs> <laughs> I'm foolish? <laughs> Go on. Uh, do you want to put... Hello, honey. Uh, How's mother? What is this? Hello. How's... Fine. She's fine. I've got Joe and Ann down here, and they're having a swell time. <laughs> I have Joe and Ann over here, and they're having a swell time. I tell you, it's a swell show. I says, Beatrice is fine. <laughs> What's going on here? <laughs> What'd you say? What'd you say? You sent my kid a baloney? <laughs> two rolls two, two of baloney for Christmas. <laughs> Listen, dear, I'm all upset here. Listen. <laughs> no joke. You get the gag? I do. What'd you say? <laughs> this is my wife speaking. Her voice was recorded. <laughs> oh boy! Oh, that was fine and sinker. Mr. Bloom recorded your uh, wife's voice. Uh, that was swell. Here you are, five dollars in war stamps, five cakes of ivory, and now we take you to the court of higher appeal. Hands appeal. Judge Ed Hurley, he presiding. The 12-day trial for lovelier hands is now in session. Will the court please come to ivory soap for dishes? Whereas you, madam, may have hands that look a little red and coarse, be it known you're probably using a strong wash day soap for dishes. Oh, that's criminal. Prosecute that strong soap. Give it up. Win the case with ivory. Give pure ivory soap a 12-day trial right in your dishpan. Ivory summons velvet suds. They're pure. They're mild. They're gentle. Just ask baby. Ivory's own star witness. Madam, you'll say, laws, these suds feel wonderful. Your hands will testify to that. For in 12 days, 12 days, what evidence? Your hands will look much whiter, softer, smoother. Ivory's fee, about a penny a day for dishes. Get three large-sized cakes of Velvet Suds Ivory. It's a saving of the third degree. Twelve days, lovelier hands. To wit, to wit, uh... Oh, we're too witty. <laughs> this is, uh, Private John Hausnack. Mr. Hausnack, how are you? How are you? Okay, boy, Mary Edwards of Baltimore, Maryland, no relation, sends us in. An actor standing in the wings heard several hundred people applauding, yet when he stepped before the footlights a moment later, there was not a single person in the theater. How do you account for this, Private... Uh, Hosneck of Louisville, Kentucky, truth or consequences? And he stepped before. Yeah, he heard several hundred people applauding out in the audience. And when he stepped before the footlights a moment later, there was not a single person in the theater. How do you account for well, it? Well, there was more than a single person in the audience. No? 
They were all married. No uh, single person. You haven't told the truth, so you must pay the consequences. We're going to get your lucky number tonight. Look into this magic ball of here that we have, this crystal ball, and say, oh, master of the crystal ball, are you listening? We'll get you your lucky number. Numerology is a great thing. Go ahead, say it. Oh, oh master of the crystal ball. Of the crystal ball. Are you listening? Or are you listening? Hello, Holsey. What's on your mind? Yeah, now ask him. <laughs> Gee whiz. Tell him to give him your magic number. Give you... Oh, give me my magic number, Crystal yeah. Ball. Your number? Oh, number, yeah. Let's see. I had it here someplace. Uh, uh, oh, here it is. Atwater 9, 109. Not... No, that's Gertrude. Uh, oh, here it is. Number 7. Your number is 7, Holsey. 7. Okay, that's all we want to know. Here's your $5 and 5 cakes of ivory. Wait a minute, Edwards. I said his number was 7. Make that $7 and 7 cakes oh. of ivory. Okay. Now, listen. How would you like to take out a model to a show tonight? All right? Oh, gee, that'd be swell. All right. Here's that very beautiful model. Hold it, Edwards. Make that seven beautiful models. Oh, yes, sir. Seven. Do you think you can handle seven models? Well, I can make a stab at it. All right. Here they are. Jump of the world's greatest girls. Seven time recover girls. Miss D. Duncan. Come out. Louise Walsh. Sue Thomas. Lorraine Walker. Michael Wheeler. Choo Choo Johnson. And Jean Christie. Seven of the most beautiful girls in the world. Here they are. Here you are. Thank you. One. I say the Capitol Theater because Seven Days Leave is playing there. All right, have a good time on your way. Now? Yeah, and right now. And I tell you what, because Seven is your lucky number, we'll have seven sailors come to escort the girls so that they can keep an eye on you. Seven sailors to help out, too. There they go. consequences in. We hope you all see it. And now, before we announce the grand prize winner, let me ask you this important question. Were you planning to travel at Christmas time? All right, then listen to the consequences. I see a Christmas tree. I see a mother and a father and a baby sister. They're sitting, waiting for a soldier boy, and he doesn't come home. And why? Because you took the train he had hoped to make. You bought the seat he'd hoped to take. He can't get home. The trains are full. Now, folks, 51% of all travel today is still for pleasure, and that shouldn't be. We're trying to move troops a million every month. We need those planes and trains and buses. And now comes Christmas time. Every bus should take to the road, every train to the rails with the most important cargo in the world. Our boys going home before they go to war. Going home for Christmas. If you travel, they can't make it. If you stay right where you are, they can. Which is the Christmas spirit? Let's all get in this. Who's the grand prize winner tonight, Herb? It is uh, Mrs. Uh, Bloom, who... Uh, oh, Mr. and Mrs. Bloom. He made the telephone call. <laughs> the hoax telephone call. You get a $25 war bond, another war bond. It joins millions more to help build the might of America. Thanks, and now for Procter & Gamble, this is Ralph Edwards saying good night until we meet again next week. Good night, everybody! <laughs> This program came to you from New York. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Postum present... Henry! Coming, Mother! Postum presents The Aldrich Family, written by Clifford Goldsmith. Entertainment for all the family, brought to you by Postum, a tempting, wholesome drink for all the family. Postum. Have you noticed, friends, how a mother can sing as simple a melody as that to a baby? And very often, even before she's finished the song, that baby is sunk in sweet, sound slumber. But as we grow older, many of us lose the ability to slip off to sleep quickly. And isn't that particularly true about some of you who drink coffee? For coffee does keep many people awake, even though others can drink it without ill effect. If you happen to be one of the wakeful ones, it might be sensible to switch to Postum, which contains no caffeine or other stimulant. Nothing at all that can possibly rob you of sleep. Postum has a grand flavor, you know. Rich, full-bodied. The kind of drink that makes you fairly expand with satisfaction. So if you think coffee disturbs your sleep, start now to make Postum your regular mealtime drink instead of coffee. 
Give it a fair trial. And then see if you're not pleased as punch that you switched. First, because you're sleeping so much better. And second, because Postum is such a really swell drink. A boy is a boy, and that's all there is to it. He gets into difficulties somehow, and he gets out of them somehow, like Henry Aldrich. But what happens in between is usually unforgettable. The scene opens at the Aldrich dinner table. Will you have another piece of cherry pie, Sam? No, thank you, Alice. Sam, are you upset about something? Who, I, Alice? No, what makes you think I'm upset? Well, dear, you've hardly spoken during this entire dinner. Well, frankly, I don't for the life of me see why you had to invite Homer over here for dinner and to spend the night. Sam, I had to. His mother and father have gone over to Abbott City. And besides, one more person certainly isn't going to make any great difference. But, Alice, do you realize it's 20 minutes after 8 and we're finishing dinner and Henry and Homer haven't even shown up yet? Yes, dear, and I'm going to speak to both of them. Although the only thing I feel bad about is these potato pancakes. And that's another thing, Alice. How did we happen to have potato pancakes? Well, I was going to have cream cauliflower, but Homer says he doesn't eat it. That's still no excuse for for potato pancakes. Sam, they're one of Homer's favorite dishes. That's also why I went to the trouble of making a cherry pie. Homer loves cherries. Then I say the least he could have done was to have been here in time to eat them. Just where are the boys? Can't we phone them someplace? Well, I don't know where they are. They left here right after school and went out to sell war bonds. They're selling war bonds? Yes, dear. They've both been made Minutemen? Minutemen? Well, they're an hour and a quarter late. <laughs> Alice, how do you know something hasn't happened to them? Now, Sam, just be sensible. They certainly aren't very far away. Oh, that may be Henry right now. He wants you to come and get him someplace. You tell Henry that wherever he is, he's to start for home at once. Yes, dear. Hello? Yes, Mrs. Kendall, this is Mrs. Aldrich. Oh, really? Really, this afternoon? You don't say so. Well, Mrs. Kendall, I'll tell him. Thank you for calling. Goodbye. Alice, did you tell him his dinner's getting cold? Uh, Sam, that was Mrs. Kendall, and she's terribly upset. Yes? What's the trouble? Well, she just discovered Henry made out a war bond pledge for her to sign, and she thought it was for $100, and it was for 1000 Yes? Yeah. And he also left one of his fur-lined gloves there. At the Kendall's? Alice, the Kendall's live at least a mile and a half out of town. Yes, dear, on the north road. But a mile and a half isn't so far. I know, but it started to snow. It's snowing hard, and I say they ought to be here. <laughs> Did you get your folks, Henry? No, Homer. Gee whiz, the line's still busy. Boy. Every time I call him, it seems to be busy. Boys, we just had a phone call for you. You did, Mrs. Cooper, from my father? From your father? No, for Mrs. Snyder. She lives about a mile on up the road. Mrs. Snyder? Yes, yeah, she called to ask whether you know you left one of your overshoes at her house. We did. Oh, boy, look, it's mine. Now, listen, Homer, you're getting more darn careless. Well, I can remember everything, Henry. I have to carry all our pencils and all our bond information, don't I? Say, aren't you boys sort of hungry? Hungry? I've got some nice corned beef and cabbage out in the kitchen I could warm up for you. Oh, no, Henry's mother has a swell dinner waiting for us. She fixed some potato pancakes and a cherry pie, just because I like them. Potato pancakes and cherry pie? Sure. As a matter of fact, I like any kind of cherries. Just so long as they're canned. Well, you're easy to please, aren't you? Uh, Jane. Yes, well, I'll be right there. Henry, don't you think you ought to try phoning your folks again? Well, I'll try, Homer. But my folks know we're out selling bonds, and if they aren't worried, why should we get upset? <laughs> Alice, if that's the boys, I want to speak to them. Hello? Yes, this is Samuel Aldrich. Who is it, Sam? It's long distance. Oh, my goodness. Hello? Sam, who is it? Hello? Alice, it's Homer's mother. Oh, my goodness, from way over in Abbott City? Yes, Elizabeth, Homer's fine. No, he's no trouble at all. Mrs. Aldrich made some potato pancakes for him tonight, and... and you want to speak to them? Well, Elizabeth, right this minute, he's... Uh, um, he and Henry stepped out for a few minutes, but there's nothing to worry about. I don't think. Yes, Elizabeth. We'll see that he wears his overshoes. Yes, goodbye. Sam, 
Sam, do you realize it's going on 9 o'clock? Well, what if it is? But don't you realize it's snowing out and Henry has only one glove? I know it, Alice, but you told me not to worry. Dear, if Elizabeth Brown was worried enough to call all the way from Abbott City, it seems to me the least you can do is worry a little. Sam, let me answer it. I'll see who it is. Hello? Yes, this is Mrs. Aldrich. Yes, Mr. Edmonds. My goodness, two hours ago? His earmuffs? Well, thank you so much. Goodbye. Where is he? Henry left his earmuffs at the Edmonds out on the North Road nearly two hours ago. At the Edmonds? That means they're getting farther and farther away from home. And Sam, just listen to that wind howl out there. Well, I know what I'm going to do. Sam, where are you going? Get my hat and coat. You mean you're going to look for them? But, Sam, do you think you can drive the car through this snowstorm? Now, don't worry about me, Alice. It's the boys you've got to think about. Those boys comfortable in the other room, Jane? Yes, Will. And, Will, don't say anything, but I'm going to surprise them. Yes? I'm going to fix them some potato pancakes and open a can of cherries. Yeah. Was that all? Well, one of them says it's all he ever eats. Yes? Mr. Cooper? Yes, sir, I'll be right there. Uh, Mr. Cooper, are you sure your phone works all right? I don't know why it shouldn't. Uh, you boys wouldn't like to stay overnight, would you? Oh, no, no thanks. If we don't get home before long, my, my folks might begin to wonder where we are. Sorry we couldn't buy a bond from you boys. If we only had some way to get our cow into town and sell her, I'd be able to buy one. You would, Mr. Cooper? Yeah, but my truck's broken down. Well, Henry, why couldn't we help him get his cow into town? Sure, we could walk her in for you. Well, if you want to come out and get her someday, she's right out there in the barn. And you'll buy a war bond? We'll turn every cent we can get for her into bonds. Will, where's the can opener? Uh, just a minute, Jane. I'll be right there. Boy, Henry, I'll bet if we could sell that cow, we'd get $50 for her. 50 Homer. 50 are you crazy? Is that too much for a good cow? Too much, Homer. Gee whiz, I heard of a cow once selling for a thousand dollars. A thousand? Or maybe it was two or three thousand. Just an ordinary cow? What do you mean, ordinary? She gave something like five tons of butter a year. Does that sound very ordinary? Five tons of butter? Sure. Are you sure it was butter? Homer, the point is we can sell Mr. Cooper a bond. Oh. Well, listen, Henry, is that the wind I hear outside? Boy. We ought to be getting started for home. What do you say we take a look out the front door? Put your things on first, Homer. I'm putting them on. I'm putting them on. Come on, let's take a look out here. Oh, boy. Henry, do you think we ought to go home tonight? We've got to. Don't you realize we're going to sell more bonds tomorrow, and we've got to get an early start? Well, that's true. Well, let's get started. Oh, Mrs. Cooper. Mrs. Cooper. Don't leave that door open like that. Close it and come on. Okay. Now, don't push me, Homer. I'm not pushing you. I'm just hanging on to it. Listen, Homer, I've got an idea. Boy, if we can do it. Good evening, Mrs. Edmonds. Oh, good evening, Mr. Aldrich. What are you doing way out here? Come on in out of the snow. Thank you. Thank you. I understand Henry and a friend of his were out here, and I thought you might give me some information as to which way they went. Well, as I recall it, they were here about 6 o'clock. Mr. Edmonds bought a bond from them. Oh, and incidentally, here are Henry's earmuffs. Oh, uh, thank you. Thank you. But I have no idea as to which direction they went from here, Mr. Aldrich. No. Do you mind if I use your phone, Mrs. Edmonds? Oh, no, help yourself. It's right here. Uh, hello? Number, please. Elm, 303. Elm, 303? Please. You mean your boy's lost? Oh, uh, no. No, Henry isn't lost, but it's getting on toward 10 o'clock, and naturally we feel more comfortable. Hello? If... Hello, is this you, Alice? Yes, dear. Where are you? I'm out at the Edmonds. Well, my goodness, Sam, they announced on the radio that the storm was getting worse and the cars were getting stuck, and I phoned for a tow truck to go out and find you. Alice, why did you do that? Because I hadn't heard from you, Sam. Did you find the boy? Uh, no, Alice, I thought that maybe by this time you would have some word from them. Well, I've had one phone call, Sam, from the Joneses. The Joneses? They live out on the North Road. And Mr. Jones says Henry and Homer had been there, and that after they left, he found an automatic pencil with your name on it. My pencil? Yes, dear. Well, that's a fine thing. <laughs> Alice, I'm going to have a talk with Henry. Now, dear, let's not worry about a pencil at a time like this. Let's find the boys. All right. Goodbye, dear. Goodbye. Mrs. Edmonds. Yes, Mr. Aldrich. Which direction do the Joneses live from here? Well, you want to go on out this road about two more miles. 
two miles. Yes, are the boys out there? No, but they've been out that way. Mr. Aldrich, I've just been talking with Mr. Edmonds, and he's going to take his car and work in the other direction. You sure it won't be too much trouble? No, not at all. He went to bed a little early tonight, but just as soon as he gets his clothes on, he'll be starting. Oh, thanks. <sighs> Some night out. Mr. Aldrich, don't you want me to get you a paper bag to put those earmuffs in? No, thank you. I'll put them right on. <laughs> Is this some night, Homer? Keep your head down, Henry, and sort of walk backwards. What do you think I'm doing? Boy! Henry, look ahead. There's a truck or something. Where? Right down the road. It's just standing there. Oh, boy! Come on! I'm coming. There's only so fast I can go, though, Henry. Gee whiz, I'm not Hercules. Look, Homer, it's a tow truck. Hey, mister! Mister! Who's that? It's us! Can you give us a lift, please? Okay, if I can get out of this drift here. Well, gee whiz, are you going all the way into Centerville? Yep, just as soon as I find a car I'm out looking for. Hop on the back. Well, look, uh, do you have room for a cow on your truck? What's that? We've got this cow, see? We're taking her into town for a guy, and we're going to surprise him. Your what? Sure, he wants to buy a barn. Say, ain't she cold? Oh, gee, no. We got two blankets tied around her. Jane, how are you coming? Shall I tell the boys to come into their supper? Not for another minute, Will. I want to get these potato pancakes a little bit browner. I knew all the time we'd find a can of cherries down the cellar. Just a case of our keeping on, we located them. <laughs> Didn't I hear Bess mooing when we came up from the cellar? Well, what if you did? She's all right. She couldn't warm out there in the barn. Of course she is. She likes the cold. All right, Will. You better call them. Uh, boys, Mrs. Cooper has a little surprise for you. Boys. Tell them to hurry right up, Will. Uh, boys. Oh, boys. <laughs> Bess, come on. Come with Henry. You know, Henry, she isn't a bad cow, is she? No, she isn't. And I think she likes walking better than she did riding on that truck. Boy, that wasn't a lot of work. Just nicely got her on the darn thing, and he runs right into another drift. That driver was a nice guy, though. It was very decent of him to promise to buy a bond from us. Well, wait a second, Henry, wait a second. What's the matter? Have... Have we gotten off the road a little? Oh, boy, where'd this snowdrift come from? Now, wait, Homer. Get around on the other side of her and we'll try to back her out. Oh, wait a second, Henry, wait a second. I think she's getting cold around the ears. Well, what are you going to do? Tie my muffler around her head, what do you think? Well, gee whiz, that's a good idea. Then she'll be really comfortable. <laughs> Yes, this is Mrs. Aldrich's residence. Why, no, Mr. Kilmer, I haven't heard a word from Sam. Yes, Mr. Kilmer, they went right out on the north road. Well, if you don't mind taking your car out on a night like this, I'd certainly appreciate it. Gee, Homer, it's nice and warm in here. Yeah, boy. Imagine finding a roadside stand open this time of night. Boy, I wish we had a little money with us. I'll say. Something smells good, doesn't it? Homer, are you sure you tied Bess real tight? Sure, I tied her with a special slip knot I learned from a guy. She ought to be very comfortable where we left her. There isn't any wind there or anything. Something I can do for you, boy? Oh, why, no, ma'am. We just... uh, We couldn't have a sort of a drink of water, could we? A drink of water? Yeah, we've been out in that darn storm, and, and are we thirsty? Which way are you driving? We're not driving, we're walking. Walking? Yeah, we've been selling war bonds, and, and I guess we got a little further out than we thought we had. You've been selling bonds? Yeah. Had any dinner? Uh, no, ma'am. That's why we'd sort of appreciate a glass of water, if it wouldn't be too much trouble. 
Well, you certainly ought to have something to eat. I'll be glad to fix you up. Free of charge, free of charge. You want a hamburger and some soup? A hamburger? Uh, the only thing is, you don't have any potato pancakes, do you? Potato pancakes? And canned cherries. I sort of had my mind made up for those all day. Potato pancakes? And do you have any hay? Any hay? Sure, for best. She's outside. Henry, she wouldn't want some corn, too, would she? No, Homer. It might upset her. Well, I can get you the potato cakes and the cherries, but I can't get you the rest. Well, that's all right. I think Bess had a little supper before we left anyhow. Hey, boys, have either of you got a shotgun? What's that? A shotgun? Yeah, yeah, there's a moose outside here. Gee whiz, a moose! Scared the daylight out of me. First it made a noise like a cow, and then as it swung around the building here and headed out toward the road, I saw it was a big, shaggy moose. Homer, come on. Listen, Henry, I'm not going to chase any moose. Where'd it go, mister? Where'd it go? He headed right up the road there. Homer, aren't you coming? That's best. Come on. I don't know. It begins to look as if Homer Brown would never get those potato pancakes, doesn't it? On the other hand, by the time he and Henry plow through another mile or two of cold and snow, they may be lots more interested in something good and hot to drink. And that could very well be Postum. For Postum is certainly a good drink, and served piping hot in the cup with cream or top milk added to taste, Postum has a look that says, Drink Me, in capital letters. And as for taste... It's my opinion there isn't a mealtime drink made that can beat that tantalizing goodness, that lusty, robust postum flavor, a flavor that's really distinctive, really unusual. Now, that means you mustn't expect when you try it that postum is going to taste like coffee any more than you'd expect coffee to taste like tea. Remember, postum has its own special goodness. And like as not, when you've once discovered how very good that is, You and Postum will be mealtime partners the rest of your days. So tomorrow, get Postum at your grocer's. And tomorrow night, get set to enjoy one of America's great mealtime drinks, Postum. Now getting back to the troubles of Henry Aldrich. Henry and his friend Homer out selling war bonds have been unable to get back home in time for dinner because of a heavy blizzard. The scene opens on a road some distance outside Centerville. The time is very late at night. Aren't you Mr. Aldrich from Centerville? I am. Well, guess you're the fellow I was sent out to tow in. Oh, yeah? How'd you get your car sideways across the road like this? Well, I've been out looking for my son and a friend of his, and... I was driving along, and I know you won't believe me, but coming right up the road toward me, I saw a bear. What's that? A big black bear. He was walking on all fours, and I jammed on the brakes and swerved around like this. Well, Mr. Aldridge, there aren't any bears in this part of the country. That's what I thought, but I saw it with my own eyes. What's that, another car trying to get by? Hey, what's the trouble there? There's a fellow here says he was just attacked by a bear. What's that? Look, while you're hooking on, I'll go into this roadside stand here and phone my wife. Something I can do for you? Uh, good evening. Uh, you have a telephone here? Sure, right over there by that jukebox. Well, by the way, you couldn't be fixing something up for me that's hot, could you? Well, I've got a special on tonight. Potato pancakes. Potato pancake. No, thanks. I'll just telephone. <laughs> Homer, come on in the house. I'm coming. Boy, am I cold. Mother will fix us up with something right away. Mother! Mrs. Aldrich. Mother! Father! She was... Do you suppose they've gone out? Come on, Henry. Let's see what's out in the kitchen. You know, I think Bess is going to be very comfortable where we left her. I don't know why she shouldn't be. Look, Homer, look in the icebox. Your favorite food. What is it, Henry? What is it? Potato pancakes. And boy, do I like them cold. And look, Homer, there's half a cherry pie there. Oh, boy, we'll split it, Henry. Here, put it on here over on the kitchen table. Okay. Oh, boy, what a dinner. Oh, boy. Now, listen, Homer, when you cut that pie, at least use a knife. It breaks all right, Henry. It breaks very nicely. (laughs) Hand me a potato pancake. Don't bother me, Homer. I, I just found something. What? A note here. It's for my father. It says, 
Sam. Harriet called and thinks they might have gone to the movies. Have gone down to the movies to look. Who wrote it? My mother. Who do you think? Boy, I wonder if it's a good picture she's seen. Aren't you going to eat anything, Henry? Here, Homer, use a fork. Remember, you're a guest. I don't need a fork. I'll just roll them up and slip them in. Answer the phone, will you, while I catch up with you. Okay. Homer, won't you please hurry? I'm going to answer it, Henry. I've got to get my mouth emptied first, though. Hello? Who? Well, this is Homer Brown. Oh, gee whiz, is that you, Mother? Sure, this is Homer. Well, I haven't been any place. Oh, we got a cow, see? A cow! We're going to turn it into war bonds. No, Mr. and Mrs. Aldrich aren't here. They've gone to the movies. Sure. And in a few minutes, I'm going to bed. Yes, Alice. My goodness, dear, where have you been? Where have I been? Where have I been? Where are the boys? Haven't you found them? No, Alice. All I found were these earmuffs, this overshoe, and my pencil. Where were you when I was trying to phone you? Sam, didn't you get my note? What note? Oh, of course you didn't, dear. How could you? I've been down to the movies. You went to the movies? Yes, dear, and I just called Harriet and gave her a piece of my mind. What about? She gets the silliest ideas, Sam. First she called me and said she thought she'd seen the boys going to the movies earlier in the evening. And now what do you think she says? What? She says there's a story going around that somebody saw a bear out on the edge of town. What's wrong with that? What? I saw a bear myself. Now, Sam. I did, Alice. That's how I got stuck. Has something gone wrong with the car? No, it's all right now. I've got it out in front. And what I want to know is where I'm going to look for the boys next. Alice. Alice. Did you hear what I just heard? No, dear. What was it? Well, I'm not sure, but it sounded like a cow. Now, Sam, first you see a bear, and then you come home and hear cows. I don't know what it is I hear, but it's certainly something, and I'm going out to see what it is. But, Sam! Hello? What's that, Mrs. Edmonds? Mr. Edmonds is back home? He had to leave his car on a hill. Oh, isn't that a shame? Mr. Aldrich left what at your place? His scarf? Well, thank you so much for calling. Mother! Goodbye. Mother, is that you down there? Henry Aldrich, where are you? She was, I've been in bed. Did you see a good picture? Henry, what's happened to Homer? Oh, me, Mrs. Aldrich. I'm all right. I just have a little stomach ache. For some reason, Mother, we weren't able to get to sleep. May I ask where you've been? Selling bombs, Mother. And it looks as though we're going to break all the records. Boy, I'll say. We sold a bond at darn near every place we went to. But, dear... Oh, but, gee, look at my earmuffs. Did I leave these here before I start off today? Henry, your father found those. Father? Where is he? He's outside, dear. And when he comes in, I wouldn't bother him very much. Is something wrong with him, Mrs. Aldrich? He's tired, Homer. Very tired. And so much on edge, he even thinks he hears a cow. A cow, Mother? Yes, dear. He just stepped out to look for one. Gee whiz, Henry. Do you suppose Bess is calling us? Who? Bess, Mother. Bess. Our war bond cow. Sure, Mrs. Aldrich. We're going to surprise a farmer. Surprise a what? A farmer, Mother. We're going to sell his cow for him. Where? Where? Henry, where is the cow? Out in the garage. In the garage? Sure, we brought her all the way into town. Through this door? Yes, Mother, but we kept her good and warm. And we now have a cow out in our garage? Sure, we even gave her some oatmeal. Boy, did she lap it up. Now, dear, oatmeal. Sure, Mother, we even put some milk on it. Milk? You gave her some of our milk? Oh, no, Mrs. Aldrich. We drew some off of her and poured it on the oatmeal. Well, boys, if I were you, I'd go back upstairs before your father comes in. Right now? Right now. Will you promise to call us, Mrs. Aldrich, if he feels best wants us? Yes, dear. Come on, Homer. As a matter of fact, I'm beginning to feel the strain a little myself. Same here. At least I want to lie down. Alice! Uh, Yes, Sam? I know you'll say I'm seeing things, but there is a cow in our garage. Well, yes, dear, of course there is. What's that? The boys put her there. What boys? Henry and Homer, they're upstairs in bed. Why didn't you tell me? What did they bring a cow home for? Well, Sam... Of all... Now, Sam, where are you going? I'm going up and have a talk with them. Now, Sam, come back here. What for? Don't you realize those boys have been selling bonds all day? That's no excuse, Alice. Think of what I've been through tonight. But do you think of what they've been through, too? They sold a bond at every house they went to. Yes? And that cow, Sam, that upset you so. 
Do you realize what that cow is? What? A war bond pledge. What's that? Yes, dear. And they led her all the way back to town through this storm and everything. They hadn't even had supper. My goodness, Sam, don't you realize what that means? But, Alice, they might have given us a little consideration. Sam, they hadn't even given themselves consideration. There's only one thing that was important, and that was to sell just as many bonds as they possibly could. That's the only spirit with which we're going to win this whole war. Well... Mother! Yes, dear? Could you come take a look at Homer? At Homer? Yes, please. He's beginning to think the cherries in that pie weren't pitted. Friends, you can get Postum in two forms, Postum and Instant Postum. Instant Postum is the quick and easy way to make one cup or six. Because Instant Postum dissolves instantly in your cup by just adding boiling water. No matter which form of Postum you choose, however, you can count on enjoying a delightful and distinctive treat. For Postum is one of America's great mealtime drinks. Here you are, Mrs. Cooper. Yes, Mr. Aldrich. Here's the money the boys got when they sold your cow. Well, thank you. And now you can sign a pledge for a bond. Well, it certainly was nice of you to drive all the way out here. Won't you stay and have a little bite of lunch with us? Can we, Father? Why, fine, fine. All right, I'll go out to the kitchen and put the potato pancakes on. Potato pancakes? Now, wait. Listen again next week, same time, same station, for another sparkling half hour with your favorite youngster, his family, and his pals. The Aldridge Family is written by Clifford Goldsmith. The original musical score is conducted by Jack Miller. And this is Dan Seymour saying, your host tonight is Postum, and Postum is one of America's great mealtime drinks. It's good drinking. Good night. <laughs> Division presents a rebroadcast of Kay Kaiser's College of Musical Knowledge. And here's the old professor himself, Kay Kaiser! Folks, hi y'all. Okay. You're okay, Kay. Well, that's great. And tonight, children, we are holding class from Constitution Hall in Washington, D.C. for more members of the armed forces than I ever saw before in my whole life. Why, there's thousands of them here. It's <laughs> Kay Bibble's news event, Washington, D.C. Kay Kaiser's show hits Washington, Washington hits back. Oh, timely observation. Ish K. Bibble's proclamation to the people. Don't pay no attention to rumors. If you know a rumor, shoot him and grab his room. <laughs> Out of here! Why, Ish, Ish, you're sensational, but we've got to get educational. These children want to cut the cake for that $115 war bond steak. But before they take that first chance, come on, Dylan, and yes, dance. Put your arms around me, honey.
Jones dances, Billy Mason. Come on, Jones. Put your arms around me, honey. Won't you hold me tight? Huddle up and cuddle up with all your might. Now, oh, my little baby, when you roll those eyes, those burning blue eyes that I just idolize, and when they look at me, my heart begins to float, and it starts to rockin' like a motorboat. Now, oh, my little baby, I never knew any girl, why any little girl like you. Time for exams get nigher and nigher. Well, Dean, bring out the first service trier. Ah, uh, cut it out, you great big skinny old bunch of nothing. Why, Ferdinand, what's the matter? I'm at Coco. Well, he stole 15 cents out of my purse. I bet you I never need to stole 15 cents out of her purse. Well, how much will you bet? 15 cents. <laughs> and furthermore, he put a frog in my stocking. A frog in your stocking? Ferdinand. Gee, I'd hate to be you. Yeah, but I bet you wouldn't mind being that frog. <laughs> Out of here. Where's that first contestant? Where is he? Right here, sir. Here's our first I'm contestant. Trying. What's the use? Where? Dean Grover, bring him up here. Well, look at him. him. It's a she. Look at that cute whack. It's Corporal Edith McRobbie, stationed at Fort Belvoir, and she's from New York City. <laughs> now, say... Say, Corporal Edith McRobbie, uh, Fort Belvoir, Virginia, is really represented here tonight. And in this one from Miss Mary Lou Vanderdorst of Culver City, California, she says one of the boys from Fort Belvoir in Virginia engineered a pass and was having a time here in Washington. Well, about 3 a.m., he came across two of his buddies. He said, hello, boys. Hi, you know, I bet you think that I've... Uh... <laughs> I bet you think I've been... Making whoopee. Making whoopee. Ah, that's right. Well, his buddies from Fort Belvoir in Virginia said, Oh, of course not. In fact... <laughs> in fact, they said... Mm, a thousand... Mm. A thousand times no. Uh, no, no, a thousand times no. Very good. And now, here is Sergeant Thomas Laney, stationed at the Marine Barracks, and he's from Grand Rapids, Michigan. Hey, Thomas Laney. All right, Thomas. Say, you know there's a gang from the Naval Air Station at Anacostia with us tonight, and for those swell flyers, Carl Nelson of Panama City, Florida, wants to know if you can distinguish between flyweight and flywheel. What's a flyweight? Speaking uh, of flying. A small boxer. A small, light box. I think about 112 pounds, somewhere along there. Yes, or a wrestler. What about a flywheel? What's a flywheel? Well, that's a wheel on a car or on a motor. Well, yes, that's the wheel that fly that makes the... Well, the, the, that's what it yeah. is. Yeah, that's yeah. very good. And now for the Navy Yard, what's a yard bird? I think everybody here knows that. It's a serviceman that doesn't do any work. Serviceman that doesn't do any work is a yard bird. <laughs> Well, what about a switching yard? Is that a yard where you switch everybody that's been bad? No. What's a switching yard? That's in a railroad. That's where they switch trains around. That's exactly right. He's right in there on the level. Right. Here is a hero of eight major South Pacific naval battles, a chief fire control man, S.E. Crow, from the U.S. Navy Yard, and he's from Ida Bell, Oklahoma. Come 
talk and say... Say, Chief of uh, the Crow, we are certainly proud of you. I know that you don't like the Crow, but some Crow, but we like the Crow about you. It's mighty wonderful to have you back with us, and we're very proud to have you on our program. Now, listen closely. The Army engineers of Fort Belvoir are here in force tonight, and Miss Virginia Hill of Denton, Texas, wants you to tell us where this Belvoir engineer boy hails from. <laughs> Georgia Tech. Georgia Tech, that's right. Now, listen, around Fort Belvoir, those engineers are continually putting something together or taking it apart. So let's play put and take. Now, here's a put and take top that you spin, you know, with the usual numbers on it. All we want you to do is spin it. Now, if it comes up put, you put as many crackers as the put and take top calls for right in your mouth and try to whistle, I'm a rambling wreck from Georgia Tech. But, but, if it comes up take, then you get to take as many kisses as you spin from our three gorgeous lasses, or, if they will permit, a wave, a whack, or a spa. Now, let's spin the put and take. All right. Now, wait. Let's take the spin the put and take and see whether he has to put or whether he gets to take some kisses. Now, go ahead. He's spinning it. Oh, oh, oh don't get too nervous now. Spinning again. Here it goes. It's spinning. Will it be put or will it be take? It's slowing down. It's slowing down. Oh, his faith is on one more little spin. It's slowing down. It's down. It's going to be... It's a star. It's neither one. Spin it again. You have to spin it again. <laughs> ah, yes. There we go. Ah, he spin it. It's going around. Will he have to whistle with crackers in his mouth, or will he get to kiss the lassies? <laughs> ah, faith, faith. The spinning of the wheel. It's slowing down. <gasps> Which will it be? Oh, it's going to be... Oh, <laughs> hurry up. Oh. Oh, bro, you really spend it. Oh. Take two. He gets to take two kisses. your battles to his credit. Yes. All right, there we go. Say, Dean, uh, is that the end of the first exam? Yes, you were really cooking in Virginia, Ham. Uh, uh, here's the first round. Please. Please. Professor, right there. Hey, there. <laughs> listen closely. The Marine is the winner. It's contestant number two with a perfect score to Marine Thomas Laney of Grand Rapids, Michigan. <laughs> Children, here's something that even the Democrats and the Republicans agree on. There's nothing prettier than our stop, look at, and listen to gal, gorgeous Georgia Carroll. Oh, uh, yes, and tonight, Georgia is going to sing for the first time anywhere a brand new song that she sings in our forthcoming RKO picture around the world. The song, Don't Believe Everything You Dream. Never dream that I could love another. Just let it go in one dream and out the other. Don't believe everything you see. If you dream that someone's making love to me, wake right up and count to ten. Never dream that dream again. Don't believe everything. Darling, just believe in me.
steely Everything you dream Your imagination may be too extreme If you should ever dream that I could love another Just let it go in one dream and out the other Don't believe everything you see And if you dream that someone's making love to me Wake right up and count to ten And never dream that dream again Don't believe everything you dream Darling, just believe Well, Dean, let's have the first, second guesser. It is Private Leonard uh, uh, Leibowitz of Fort Belvoir from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. All right, yes, Private Leonard Leibowitz from Philadelphia. Say, Private, radio engineers, you know, really have to work very hard. So Engineer Bob Maurice has a buddy who twists the dial for a lot of stars each week. Now, from the following clues, see if you can tell us which three stars we mean. He twists the dials for this one. I'd love to spend each he's, got it, he's, got it, he's got one. That's fine. Now, here's the second one. How do you do, ladies and gentlemen? This is... Uh... <laughs> or... <laughs> well, we're a little late tonight, folks. So thanks for the memory. Bob Hope, Bob sir. Hope, that's right. Now, the poor engineer has a little trouble getting all that show in. They usually run over. But he has more trouble keeping the O's and R's out of this one. Now, listen. In the blue of you Frank Sinatra, sir When you appear He's got it, he's got it, what do you say? Frank Sinatra Frank Sinatra, all right, very good He got it, that's right Now the German third class Say, it's Yeoman's Well, wave me down Here is Miss a yeoman third class, Marjorie Baldwin of Wave Quarters F, and she's from Cali Coon Center, New York. Very good. All right, Miss Baldwin. Say, uh, say, Miss Baldwin, as long as we're in Washington, the waves of Wave Quarters A, B, C, D, and H, and man, they are certainly here tonight, uh, they want an F, and they want us to, and G, and, and, and H, <laughs> sounds like L, doesn't it? Now, now let's see, they, <laughs> they want us to do a question about presidents of the United States. So, from the following little skits, you pick out the names of four presidents. Now, here's the skit. You know, one of our boys is such a slow pork, he missed our train, so he hitchhiked along the Lincoln Highway. Well, he stopped to take a gander at the Hoover Dam, and he visited some friends in Cleveland. Finally, the thought began to pierce his brain that he'd better wire us for reservations so he'd have a place to hit the haze when he got to Washington. But he was too late, and he has to Coolidge Hills uh, in a hotel lobby tonight. All right, four presidents. Lincoln Hoover. Lincoln Hoover. Uh, Coolidge. Coolidge. Uh, no. Lincoln Hoover, Cleveland. Yes, there's uh, lots more in there. Uh, yes, he began to pierce his yeah, brain. Pierce his uh, Pierce and Hayes, and there's quite a few others. That's very good. Very good. And now, here we go with storekeeper second class, Miss, Miss Helen Dawson of the Coast Guard headquarters, and she's from Gallagher, West Virginia. Dawson. Now, listen, closely. Say, Miss Dawson, we have hundreds of Washington spas here tonight, and since spas know all about marching in platoons, Lieutenant Faraday of Gwynfield, Gowanfield, Idaho, wants you to distinguish between platoon, cartoon, pontoon, and looney tune. All right, what's a, pon- what's a platoon? Well, a platoon is a formation of armed service people. Yes, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a denomination, a number of... Uh, you know what I mean, don't I? Yes. Yes, that's it. Thank you. What about a cartoon? What's a cartoon? Well, a cartoon is what you read in the funny papers. You read it? Or? Well, you mostly look at it and laugh. Laugh? Yeah, that's fine. What about a pontoon? Well, that's, that's on the seaplane, the part it lands on. Well, that's very true, and also the engineers use it when they make put down a temporary bridge over water. They use a pontoon under it. You know what I mean? Is that right? That's right. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And what about a looney tune? Well, that's 
Well, you see that at the movies when you go. That's right. That's one of the, like Mickey Mouse, it's one of the, uh, the cartoons. That's very good. Now, you gave those answers so soon, I think it would be opportune for you to make a swoon by playing a tune on this bassoon. Now, put that strap around you. Now, just strap the bassoon on. Now, the band is going to play a certain song, and every time the orchestra stops, you play the bassoon. Now, that's right. Get your fingers over the keys and... Wait a minute now. Now, put this... Wait a minute, she's a little mixed up. Get your arm around. It comes around this way. That's right. Now you turn this around here. That's very good. Are you ready? Now you pearl two and drop three. Are you ready? All right. Now when the boys stop playing, you, you play. Here we go. Yes, sir. You have to. Press something and blow. Wait a minute. Just a minute. She's so busy looking it over that she doesn't quite get organized. Will you show her where to... Fine. Now that's right. That's very good. Now, now put the mouthpiece in your mouth. One thing certain we know, you can't play unless you have the mouthpiece in your mouth. All right, let's try. Ah! But not <laughs> Gentlemen, in spite of what you heard, there are more than one key on the bassoon. Thank you very much. More than one key on the bassoon. She was well, though. Yes, she was. That's right, and the winner is contestant number one with a perfect score all the way, Army Private Leonard Leibowitz of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. At night she will be waiting. Oh, wait. She'll be the truest doll in all this world. I'd rather have a paper doll to call my own than have the pickle-minded I'm going to buy a doll that I can call my very own A doll that other fellas cannot steal And then those flirty, flirty guys With that flirty, flirty eyes Will have flirt with dollars that are real When I come home at night She'll be there waiting Waiting at the door She'll be the finest doll in all the world I'd rather have a paper doll that I can call my own than to have a take minded real life girl. Two winning first rounders are on the scene. Well, Al Wright, Dean Ben Grower. And by the way, we're glad glad to have you back with us tonight, Dean Ben Grower. Let's see who wins the folding green. Uh, yes, sir, he's on the scene. It's the winner of the first round with a perfect score, Sergeant Thomas Laney. Uh, stationed at the Marine Barracks, and he's from Grand Rapids, Michigan. Now, Thomas, in our final round tonight from the nation's capital, we're hanging up the map of South and Central America. Yes, sir, they are all members of the good neighbor family in this war we're fighting and are helping us out with lots of the things we need. Lots of the nitrate and copper that go into our munitions come from Chile. Oil from Venezuela. Rubber from Brazil. And if you know this song, you'll know something else we get from Brazil. He's got it. He's got it. Caught 
coffee. That's right, Crea Coffee, that's right. Now, here are three rhythmic instruments used in Latin American music. And Miss Helen Hansen of Allendale, New Jersey, wants you to tell us which are the castanets. Here they come. That's one. That's two. I'd say the last one. I beg your pardon? The last one. I'd say the last one with the castanet? Yeah. The last one. Oh, he says the last... <laughs> the last... <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Very much. Okay. And now here we go with the winner of the second round. It's Private Leonard Leibowitz, who won the second round with a perfect score. He's from Philadelphia. We'll be... <laughs> The USA Plug produces lots of its medals, but we are importing a lot, too. Now, Sergeant William, William Keith of Rome, New York, says if you'll name this song, you'll name the medal we look to Bolivia for. <laughs> Ten. Tippy Tip Ten is the name of the song, uh, sir. In the medal is... Uh, ten, ten, ten. You ten. said ten, didn't you? Yes, thank you. Now, here are three popular Latin American types of dances. You tell us which is which. Conga, rumba, and... Uh, what was the one in the middle? The rumba was first, the conga was last, and, and the middle of the... Oh, tango, rain, tango. no more, no more. Uh, tango, tango, rain, no more. Tango was, uh, it was tango, conga, and rumba. How did he get that? Absolutely right. That's very good. Now let's see who carries Sergeant Thomas Delaney for his last question. Now, Thomas, step right up here, old boy. Speaking of Central and South America, you know, priorities on household commodities are kind of tight right now. And so Harry Sayers of North Hollywood, California, reminds us that our good neighbor Cuba is helping us to keep from having... <laughs> Keeping us to have, from having the what? What kind of blues? From Cuba. Sugar blues. The sugar blues, that's right. And now, say, what is our most interesting import from Brazil? Carmen Miranda! Who? <laughs> no, say, now listen, here are some very popular Latin American songs, so see if you can tell us which song means the big ranch and which means the little star. La Paloma, Estrellita, La Cucaracha, Rancho Grande, and Manana. The big ranch is Rancho Grande's Little Star is Escalita. Absolutely right! That boy is really, I mean, he knows his stuff. And now, here we go with Leonard Nibelwitz. The last question. Say, Leonard, I am sure you will agree with Francis Reed of Burlington, Iowa, that we all like the things that are being done the... South American way. Say it again. South American way. Yes, he's so nervous, he just likes to say everything four or five times. <laughs> Mr. Five by Five saying four or five times. <laughs> yes. Say, now, Brother Leverich, listen. With the kind of help that our good neighbors to the South and the might of our armed forces that's in front of me tonight, and believe me, it's the most thrilling sight I've ever witnessed. I wish you could see all of these various colors representing all of the branches of our service. You know, between all of these branches and our neighbors to the South, we'll win this war, and in war or peace, we'll always be... Marching along together. And you know we'll be marching along together. What about it, gang? The winner, Professor. The winner and the... Con Look, it's a tie, and both of our contestants have a perfect score all the way, and therefore... Sergeant Thomas Laney and Private Leonard Leibowitz not only win a first prize of a $50 war bond each, but for having a perfect score all the way, they get an additional $25 bond each or $75 to each one of them. <laughs>
College of Musical Knowledge was presented to you men and women in the armed forces of the United Nations by the Special Service Division of the War Department of the United States of America. <laughs> <laughs>